Uh, seeing the presence of a quorum, I uh, call this meeting of the Amherst Palm Regional School Committee to order uh, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, our first order of business is approval of the minutes of January 28, 2020. If members have had a chance to take a look at those minutes and see if you have any corrections to them. Kip, are you looking for something? Oh, you can. Mr. Fosh, I mean. Okay, you can call me Kip. <laughs> it, it seems like once that protocol starts, it's, it's oh, possible to stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually, that's the funniest thing is, is it's impossible. Anybody who's been a teacher, it's literally impossible for me, or my brother and sister's teachers, it's impossible for me not to reference them as Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. You know, it's just like literally impossible. They may have first names, but I don't know what they are. I'm filibustering, Dr. Morris. Any, any edits to the minutes? <laughs> there aren't, there's entertain a motion. Mr. Dunlap? I move to approve the minutes of January 28th, 2020, as presented. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Harrington. Moved by Devlin, seconded by Harrington. Any further uh, amendments, additions, changes? Discussion? Just, yes. Just noting, um, there's a, a, I think a misspelling of the name under seven for Mary Lou Conco, this CH, I believe. I'm not. I think there's no H, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I item know it's seven. minor, but it's no, no, it's good. Um, item item seven A. Entering that business. Hmm? Yes, it yeah, should be bus. business, <laughs> not bus. bus That's two changes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, this will give people fun. a second to look at video, look at the minutes. Is there there's anything else? Okay, uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, signify I by raising your hand. Uh, it carries one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to nothing. And the minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on our agenda is committee announcements, committee member announcements, and public comment. First thing, item businesses, any announcements from the school committee members themselves? Okay, seeing, seeing none, um, are we welcome uh, comments from members of the public, if anyone has them. They should come to the microphone, uh, state their name, and they'd have three minutes to make a comment. How, are we like wickedly far ahead of the agenda? I mean, the stated time on the agenda? Two minutes. Ahead of time? Mm-hmm. Okay, I gotta sit here for two seconds, just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, someone could be delayed. And to remind the public again, we, we welcome uh, both uh, written comments by email, by uh, traditional postal mail, uh, however you want to get to us. We welcome your views, opinions, and ideas. It's 62 that notes, um, Email um, to the whole committee can be sent to school committee one word at arps.org and then gets shared with the entire relevant committee. So, easy way to, if, you're, if <coughs> the public's looking to email the whole committee, that's a convenient way to do it. Great. Thank you. I mean, the clocks on our computers are accurate, by the way. Yeah, it's so I'm eyeballing the clock on the computer over there on the, the monitor. Ah, according to Ms. McDonald's trusty instrument in front of her, it is 635. So with that, after no public comment, I'll close public comment with the advice again that there's other ways to get a hold of us. Uh, for chair's update, uh, superintendent's update, I'm sorry, item number three. So we'll be very brief, and part of it's that there's a lengthy agenda, um, and some of the updates will be played out as agenda items. But I'll mention two things, and I think Ms. Cunningham has one. So uh, the first is a couple, I want to say two months ago or so, there were students here, um, and, and you got an email, a little, you being the committee, got an email a couple months before that around concerns about uh, calendar and holidays. And so one of the requests from those students, uh, in addition to the change in the actual calendar, was an email or communication to go to 
staff members on a monthly basis, um, just informing them of what holidays are coming up so that they didn't have to keep track of the holidays that all students celebrate, that there was a reminder um, that it could impact some students' um, either attendance at school or ability to complete extracurricular or homework assignments. And so that started in the month of February, mm -hmm. and we got a really positive response from, from staff members saying, thank you, it's hard to keep track in the middle of they're busy lives, um, and so staff are very appreciative, and thank Ms. Westmoreland, who well, many of you know very well for being the organizer of that, and uh, it was communicated back to the students who felt very positive that it was in place. You know, we loosely talked about getting that going for the next school year, but we thought it was a good idea, and we were able to implement it sooner. Um, the second piece, and we'll talk about this a bit when we talk about item 6C, which is the budget, but um, since there's a press release and an article in the Gazette, I just wanted to note that um, the university and the town uh, went through the town of Amherst. We were able to come to an agreement uh, to have funding go from the university directly to um, both the Amherst Public Schools, the bulk of it to the Amherst Public Schools, also to the regional school district um, as a good faith effort to acknowledge that there are students in tax-free housing that attend our schools. Um, this was a conversation that played out both at Amherst and the region a while ago, I guess about a year and a half ago, maybe, I'm guessing something. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to thank uh, both the university for their partnership on this, as well as the town for facilitating the conversation. Uh, and to clarify for the regional piece, uh, we looked at the last you know, five years or so and the average percentage of students attending in tax-exempt housing who attended the Amherst Public Schools compared to the regional schools, and we div divided up the, the new funding source uh, ap appropriately and proportionally to where the students were actually attending school. So the impact on the Amherst Public Schools is much greater than the regional schools, but I wanted to publicly acknowledge that fact. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll turn it to Ms. Cunningham for a quick announcement as well. Okay. So the Amherst Regional Middle School and the Pelham Elementary School principal searches have begun. And yesterday was the last day for people to notify me as to whether they'd like to join a committee or one committee or the other. So from this point on, I will be notifying those who reached out to me via email as to which committee they will be a part of. And the next step in the process is for them to start a training program with me on February, I believe, the 26th or the 27th. Great. Is that it? That's it. We're trying to be brief. Are there, are there any, the uh, any, <laughs> any questions for the superintendent, the assistant superintendent? Can you just uh, remind us um, what the general timeline is for the, uh, the middle school principal search about when the public will um, get to see candidates and, and when we expect that, that all to wrap up? Uh -huh. You would ask me that when I have no paperwork. <laughs> 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 but um, generally, generally so um, the end of February is when I'll do the training for the screening and the interview committee. And then starting in March, we will invite the candidates in. And I believe it's about the second and third week of March that we'll start actually interviewing for both um, Pelham and for the middle school. And then by the beginning, or the end of March, beginning of April, is when we'll have the community forums. The end of April is when they'll be announced. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, chair's update. Um, I would, so I, I would say that I've gotten some outreach. Um, we're going to talk about this later on regional assessment, but I've gotten some outreach um, from uh, some of the member towns following the four town meeting. And one thing I would say is it seemed like there was substantial agreement uh, around uh, the suggestion that uh, Mr. Demling had at the meeting that we needed to engage um, our towns around uh, the regional agreement and what comes next um, with all sort of options on the table. And um, I would just say that in, in my experience over the last couple of years, when we started um, the work around the, uh, the regional assessment, some of the disagreements, um, the school committee itself at times played I think early on, very early on, um, more of a passive role, and many of the um, elected select board and finance committee members within the, the member towns were more active. And I think one of the things which has worked exceptionally well, in addition to the leadership that Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter are gonna be providing, is for members to think about 
your role here as a liaison with your member towns think about how either through this forum or through others we can constructively engage with one another around what we're trying to accomplish educationally as a district and uh, how we can best be both representatives as well as ambassadors to different people in our town, both neighbors, uh, people who are activists, as well as others. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, the thing I'm excited about is I think the committee is, is functioning at a high level right now, and uh, I'm excited about uh, what we're going to be able to accomplish. And um, I, th I just think, though, that the reality is, as we head into the summer, um, there are going to be, I think, significant bumps at different points in the road. And I think for all of us and for all of you, um, you need to think actively about how you can take that leadership role. Yes. So I left out the most important superintendent update, huh? uh, and I apologize, but Emily Gribko, who is a uh, 11th grade student at this school, will be joining us for the next calendar year as a student rep. So we want to welcome Emily um, to our group. And uh, we haven't had, we've had a, had a student rep, we had a gap with that one, uh, but we're greatly appreciative. I'm greatly appreciative, and I think I speak for, for everyone sitting up here, of you joining this group. And, and the idea from the high school staff was that if someone can do a calendar year, then we can transition someone new um, because a year from now, Emily would be starting to think about other things, I'm guessing, um, <laughs> about what's happening. And then the spring of senior year gets quite busy. Um, so we really just appreciate Emily and welcome her. And um, I just wanted to, we, we were tried to connect with uh, Mr. Thompson, who is um, the faculty liaison, mm -hmm. and we weren't able to meet before this meeting, so I didn't know she was sitting in the audience. So I apologize, uh, that's my fault. Uh, but you know, again, really appreciate your time and, and coming. That's wonderful. Uh, and, and I would say that if you, um, if you want to say anything about an item on the agenda when we're discussing it, uh, normally, sometimes the gestures people make are like really subtle, um, <laughs> but, but they're supposed to raise their hand and when they do, you'll be recognized like any other member of the committee to say whatever is on your mind. Thank you. Right, thank you. I, I seem to have missed by a minute the public comments and I was just wondering if I can have uh, I actually like by a minute. I with if if the committee is okay, I will reopen public comment. See general assent. So um, three three minutes. You know it's three yeah. minutes. Yeah. So just make sure you identify yourself again, of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Caridad Martinez, and I'm a member of the Equity Task Force, and also a, a member of the community. Um, so I just wanted to read this. You know, we're, you're in the process of. Uh, looking at this budget, and uh, we had our presentation last week or the week before. And so I just wanted to continue kind of like encouraging and motivating uh, this committee and, and Mike and Doreen to, um, to look at our proposal and, you know, really take it seriously and see what we can do about it. So I just wanted to read in honor of Black History Month, I just wanted to read two paragraphs from um, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And uh, you might think, well, how does that con connect, or you might say, yeah, that connects really well. Um, this letter, for those who don't know, was a letter that he wrote from jail um, in response to um, the arrests that were made and the, uh, the response from um, clergy people from different denominations in response to the civil disobedience that, um, you know, they were uh, doing uh, pro the freedom of black people. Definitely connected to restorative justice and justice. So I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have always reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, 
who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exists for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phase of the transition from an obnoxious negative peace in which the Negro passively accepted his unjust plight to a substantive, substantive, substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity and worthy of human personality. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with. Like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed. With all the tension, it, with all the tension its exposure creates, to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. So I just want you, you know, I just want to reiterate our commitment to restorative justice um, versus punitive measures that, you know, traditionally people have held not only in this school but across all, all schools. And um, let's get out of the way of doing the right thing. Yeah? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we, we had opened up public comment after we had closed it. Um, did you come to make a public comment? Then uh, again, three minutes as is usual rule. My name is Chrissy Ryan and I'm here to address the discrimination of an African American principal at the middle school, which has continued on since two years ago. Um, as you can see, there's not much diversity on the school committee. There used to be. Um, the equity director, assistant, superintendent hybrid position was created um, out of the hard work of some members on the school committee that were working to address some disparities that occurred in the district. And diversifying the workforce was one of those initiatives. <clears throat> so this position was created in order to attract, retain people of color. So as you can recall, that was an initiative that I took up as my kids were experiencing some disparate discipline. And um, to be clear, I met Joseph Smith as a teacher working in Springfield. He was a SPED admin, a pupil services director. And that's the position that Faye Brady has here in the district, except he was engaging with the community. Um, one day I went to school and I was complaining about how my son was suspended and he told me he used to work in the school district. And I asked him why he had left and he told me that it was hard to be an assistant principal um, as a black man when his daughter, who was a senior at the high school, was experiencing some trouble. So these were his colleagues, but yet he didn't know how to advocate for his daughter who he felt was experiencing some race-based discipline. So he left. To come back to the school district was actually an act of, of bravery. He's been treated horribly since he's gone here. A former member of the school committee um, told someone on the equity task force that my advocacy for him was resulting in an uh, inappropriate relationship that I had with him. So she's actually discrediting this relationship, this completely appropriate relationship that I had with a former administrator in Springfield. It's disappointing to see that the assistant superintendent and superintendent would continue to jerry-rig the hiring process and not fulfill the one initiative, the one initiative that's coming out of the school district equity, which is to retain people of color. So as a result of my ad advocacy, he was given a co-principal, two-year contract. It was a bone, it was a bone, we all know that. Um, and then he promptly res uh, experienced un unending amounts of discrimination from the uh, teachers that worked there. Now, the investments in the school district, Eric, 
I'm going to finish. The investments in the school district um, that you're now saying are 300,000 in the red, and you're talking about your budget, have gone to investments in white people for years, to the point where now I have three people who are in middle, uh, three children in middle and high school who have no educational opportunities here and why I drive over the notch to bring them to PVPA every day. The tokenism that's occurring is not working for equity. There's LGBTQ staff and administrators that are being treated horribly for the service of a select few. So the equity director position is not being fulfilled and it needs to be uh, separated from the HR position because it's creating discrimination against other people in the school district. In order to fulfill, again, the select few individuals who are benefiting from a system that is not set up for all people. I also would like to point out that the school district has four administrators please, that have worked here for up. 25 you're, you're years. Beyond your three minutes. And they are all the same people that have worked here for 25 years. And not any of them have been held accountable there's no evaluation procedures in place. And yet, for some reason, Joseph Smith is being scrutinized unendingly while these other administrators at Wildwood, at Crocker Farm, which is deemed a failing school district, the Summit Academy, no accountability. So that's disparate discipline, I mean disparate treatment as a result of the supposed equity initiatives that have only benefited a few small couple of women that are friends with the assistant superintendent. So I think that this needs to be addressed going forward, seeing that you've renewed his contract. And this is not work that I'm gonna let go. There has been no change. And none of you have done anything about it. And there's someone on this school committee, actually, who was fired for a supported 51A child abuse allegation at the middle school who should not be on the school committee who was fired as a result of Joseph Smith having to be doing his job and I would like that person to step down, Kim Fonch. I would accept a move. Thank you adjourn, so much. Uh, a move to adjourn or for recess. Okay. Second. Withdraw my motion. Okay. Mr. Yeah, I would ask that uh, the chair that the last six sentences of the speaker's remarks be struck from the it's fact. record. It's a fact. It was a supported child abuse allegation. Nice. Look, you don't know the outcome of that six. Uh, Mr. Demling, you had a move to adjourn. Right, move to recess. recess. Okay, move to recess. Second. Uh, second. second. Is there no? All those in favor of recessing? We're recessed. Thanks. Um, I'm to go to a band concert. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if the uh, Amherst Media is still ready. Um, okay, great. That's going to be us. Awesome. Yes, I would ask um, of the chair to dismiss the members of the audience in order for me to respond to um, Ms. Ryan's um, comments. Uh, I don't. I don't think we can actually do that. Can I request that, an executive session? You can, but not at this meeting. No, I'm not trying to be funny. I mean, it's just. I know you, you're not. You, then, if I may, I may yes. have a few minutes. Hmm? May I have a few minutes to talk? To to respond to the you, claim. You can if you want. She's yeah. a, she's. A, no, I'm, I'm raking my reputation over the calls. Well, we've already. We well, put it this way. We've already reopened public comment after it was closed. So we can certainly reopen the committee member announcement portion of the agenda. Yes. So with acclamation from the committee, which I'm seeing it, um, please. In my capacity as a substitute at Amherst Regional Middle School back in October of, 19, of 2018, um, I was involved in a situation with a uh, middle school student that resulted in a couple of things. One, uh, my being pushed to the ground and uh, suffering both head and neck and shoulder problems ever since. Uh, a 51A was filed against me. 
it took almost a full year to uh, get that um, eliminated. It was a year of extraordinary um, hardship for my family and myself. Um, it was just an unbelievable experience because I knew the allegations were not true. In my opinion, the um, manner in which the administrator in charge of that situation mishandled the entire situation. I'd be more specific if I said he did it in an incompetent fashion. Um, I share that with the committee so that you can know yeah. where she was coming from. Um, it was brought to the DA. The DA did not find any reason to charge me and dismiss the complaint. Um, I do not want to go through that again. Um, I have to be very careful that I choose my words carefully, that I don't say what I really think. But if the committee wants me to resign, I will, because I refuse to go through that again in public. It's the first time that it's been open to the public. And I sincerely don't want to have to have it again. If you, by majority vote, want me to resign, I'm okay with that. I don't want to put up with this crap anymore. Thank you, Mr. Vonch. <sighs> closed committee uh, announcements and public comments also already closed. Um, and we'll move forward. We're going to switch the order of um, our items and go with item 6B uh, and then afterwards go to a statement of interest. So, welcome any introduction you have. Sorry, 6B is HR yeah. and diversity update. Um, I'm wondering if I could recommend to the committee that, um, and I'm sorry, I know that just happened that we take another recess. I am happy to take another recess. If the assent of the committee, seeing that assent. So if it's just interesting to me that I could end up riding out the way I came in. <laughs> uh, if the Amherst media ready, <laughs> yep. yes. calling the meeting back to order again, uh, and we will go to um, uh, item six B, which is HR and diversity update. Sure. So I'll just um, introduce and then hand it over to Ms. Cunningham and uh, her team. So each year we provide an HR and diversity update, and um, this is going to look pretty similar to last year's based on the feedback that we received last year when, when this um, almost the same team, <laughs> not quite the same team, presented it. And um, it really does relate to the goals of, for me, the goals of the district, um, you know, thinking about what does it mean to be a multicultural and, and uh, equity focused district. Um, some of that's about staffing and some of it's about what you do with the staff that you have and how do you provide training that's meaningful uh, for all staff members so that you're both, um, our staff over time is getting uh, increasingly diverse and that for all staff, regardless of when they join the district, uh, their background, we're providing high quality opportunities around professional growth. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Cunningham, who I think will introduce um, some other folks on her team. So before I introduce them, I know that we just had a public comment that talked about my role, and I'm not going anywhere until I'm ready, so I just want you guys to know that. <laughs> All right, so my team consisted last year of Sasha, Damani, Jen, and myself. This year, Sasha decided to move to become the assistant to Dr. Morris, and so now I have Carol, who has replaced Sasha. So without further ado, they're the ones who are going to present, and I'll just interject intermittently. So come on up. Okay, we... Good night, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. So this has been my 10th month in the district, and 
One of the things that I can say is that HR has tried, or the district has worked assiduously to try to prevent, to try to um, give, ensure that staff have professional development. Now, we have a list here of some of the things that, or the initiatives that have been taken so far, such as the implicit affinity bias in training. Um, on November 5th, we had what is called Curriculum Day, and we had 22 workshops with social justice, equity, diversity um, as the theme. Um, and that I'm going to expound on about um, expound on in a bit. Um, we also had UROC, which is a People's Institute on Doing Racism Organizing Collective, and that's for newer admins. We have Creating Inclusive Environment Workshops, Building Based Trainings, and this has to take this takes place usually when staff we have early um, release days. We also have white fragility, and this is a book group. And we have cultural responsive teaching and the brain, which is another book group. And we have, of course, our restorative circles, and that's ongoing. We also have Carol. Before you go ahead, I just want to um, go back to the UROC part where she talked about newer admins. Last year, all the other administrators were trained. They had to go through the three-day training with the People's Institute. And so the um, administrators who joined us this year, they were put through the training. So the plan is to have every administrator trained first, and then we'll continue um, with assistant um, admins, directors, and then uh, eventually all staff, we're hoping to get them <coughs> to go through the training. Okay, so other workshops we had was differentiation workshops. We had the second year teachers meetings. We also, and like I said, we're gonna go back to um, November 5th, which is the PD day. So we have some sample offerings here of workshops that were held. We had teaching this necessary um, history, which is American racism and inquiry. We had gender and sexual identity inclusive classrooms, strategies that build community. We had cultural humility, um, and cross-cultural communication. We also had support systems for our staff of color, speaking honestly about white spaces and managing microaggression. And that was for staff of color, as I said before. Now, one of the things that is noteworthy is that this was a collaborative effort with HR, um, the superintendent's office, and the curriculum instruction and assessment unit. Um, Tim Shea, who is the coordinator for that unit, he spent most of August, September, and October just preparing for the workshops and for, um, for the day um, in essence. Um, it took like 100% of Jadira, who his, is his assistant's time, two weeks part of the workshop just to get teachers registered on my learning plan to ensure that they did not have clashes in their workshops and so on. Um, Debbie, who is the the, the, um, the director for communications and um, operations. She also worked assiduously along with Erica, who is an admin support, to ensure that this workshop went well, or the day went well, in a sense. Um, and funds for, from the teaching and learning budget was also used to pay presenters and to pay the keynote speaker, as well as to provide food for this event. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, my name is Damani Gordon. I'm Diversity Equity Specialist of Human Resources. Um, and just gonna devolve on more of the professional development opportunities that are there for our paraeducators. Mm -hmm. um, we had a district-wide uh, PD day back in November, and it was open to all the paraeducators as well, even though it was their day off. And we had approximately 38 paraeducators attend, which is a great number um, considering that. Um, we also offered opportunities are for paraeducators to attend various PDs that our teachers and administrators have um, on days, on teacher work days, where they may not be um, have to work, but they can come in and get paid for that as well. So um, plenty of, um, there have been several paraeducators that have been taking advantage of that as well. And i also like to talk about, we also have a, um, what's called the Amherst Futures Program. Um, we are part of the Diverse Teachers Workforce Coalition. Um, under the banner of Paradigm Shift, and the, the coalitions we're involved with, we have um, Holyoke Public Schools, Springfield Public Schools, Mount Holyoke College, Springfield College, uh, UMass Higher Ed, we get together and we, uh, it's a program that we create pathways 
for paraeducators of color to get their teaching degree, master's of teaching degree through Mount Holyoke College. That's the partnership that we have. Um, we, we just started this a couple years ago and it's in full swing now. We have two of our paraeducators now that are co-teaching in the middle school and are do, also doing their practicum hours. So they are set to graduate with their teaching license in May, I believe. Um, and we are highly recruiting other paraeducators in a pipeline to go through with this process. So it's, it's really beneficial to our district because it's in-house and it creates opportunities uh, for the paraeducators through Mount Holyoke College. There are a lot of uh, discounts involved. There's um, Intel prep tutors free of charge, Intel courses free of charge, and also Intel vouchers. So it's opening up uh, the pool uh, of more teachers of color in our district and just Western Mass in general. Thank you. And we also, um, there, there used to be the narrative that the paraeducators were not provided an opportunity to have training alongside our teachers. And so that is not as true. We do offer them the opportunities, like Damani mentioned, to sit with the, um, their supervising teacher or to attend any of the professional development that a, a teacher um, is able to attend. And we also used to have a paraeducator program, um, professional develop development coordinator, that actually was the former president of the APEA. She used to do that. And if the need uh, becomes something that we have again, we will look to possibly open in that position again. So the paras are also offered an opportunity right now through the special ed department and HR to go through some modules where they are learning how to work with students who have uh, mood disorders, um, oppositional defiant disorder, attention deficit disorder, anxiety, which is a big need in our district, and autism. So they are offered a lot of training because they are doing a lot of the work. They're the ones that are, you know, the boots on the ground, forefront, the first person that would, would be working with the kids alongside the teachers. So we do invest in making sure that they have the trainings. Yes? Uh, someone mentioned discounts and things like that. Is this an expensive procedure for the parents? Tell me, is what an expensive procedure? Does it cost a lot of money to become licensed? Yeah, I mean, just in general, as we know, higher ed is very expensive. So off the top, it's a 30% discount um, for our paraeducators, as well as a TEACH grant that they could receive um, in high need areas. So in considering to what it would cost um, to go through with a master's of teachers program, it is significantly lower and more affordable um, as there's um, a lot of um, support as well as financial support for the parents. Right, and we also had received the teacher diversification grant through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, and a, most of the parents who are involved in the program have received funding through that program. So many of them leave without any cost to them, but there is a commitment to work with the district for another four years. Mr. Sullivan, you have a question? I'll just, um, I can add a little bit to that. As an independent student in 2011, just my student teaching class at UMass through UWW was $9,000, and that was for one semester. So expensive, yes. So it is expensive. Yeah. Mr. Bunch? I just want to uh, congratulate you on a fantastic program. Uh, the more powers you can get into the teaching profession, the more we'll all be better off. I do have a couple of questions, if I may. Make sure you're on the microphone, by the way. Excuse me? Make sure you're on the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, one is, um, I'm curious as to what the reaction of the teachers were to white fragility. And secondly, um, I wonder if you could share with us, apart from the number of parents who go on to a teaching profession, how do you measure the success of the professional development? Okay. So I'll, I'll answer that if that's okay with you. So the White Fragility Book Group, many teachers asked for the opportunity to be a part of that. And I want to hold on a second. My guess is that's making a racket. <laughs> and the reaction is they want more. So we are hoping to be able to partner with the union to um, offer more professional development because we're hearing that teachers want more. And um, based on when I first started back in 2017, 
I talked about all the investigations that I had to do, the race base and all, all, all of those investigations. I'll be proud to say that we have decreased the number of investigations based on bias. Um, and I believe that's due to some of the trainings because when we planned the trainings, it was also based on the um, information that we received, the, the, different, uh, the different incidences that occurred. So we used that to decide on what kind of topics and workshops we needed to provide for the staff. So there has been a decrease in the number of um, bias complaints. We also look at the, um, a survey that is completed after the workshop to find out how teachers are feeling and, and what next steps would be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Morris, did you say something? Oh, no, I'm sorry. You were gesturing like you might. Mm -hmm. yeah. Active listening. <laughs> so along with the paraeducator futures program that Damani talked about, that program, as he mentioned, is for paras with bachelor's degrees. This year we have started looking at, um, Tim Sheehan and I have started looking at being able to support paras who don't have a bachelor's into getting a bachelor's so that they can continue to fill into that pipeline that Damani was talking about. So, was there a question? Okay, so the next um, part is just our goal. When we started, the goal has always been to hire and retain diverse staff. And you have the numbers from 2017 all the way up to this year, as far as food service, all the way to administrators in our district. And I'm proud to say, um, Dr. Morris talked about this during convocation, but this year we hired back in August or so, or by the end of August, we hired over 118 new people, and 52 of them, which is 44%, were people of color. So through the new, the revamping of the hiring and uh, screening process, we were able to increase the number of people of color who are qualified sitting at the table, at least getting that opportunity to interview. And as you see, our numbers are a result of being able to revamp that process. And I think I'd like to add to what Ms. Cunningham said, which is uh, what's particularly notable about 44%, other than it's larger than the number has been in the past, is it, it mirrors the student population across our three districts. Um, so, you know, that's one of the goals, and, and we're going to have to keep at it, right? It's mm -hmm. not like thing you do once. I don't know. Um, I think it might be Mr. Fonch. Um, Mr. Fonch. Um, Kill it. But I just I want to highlight that. That's been a goal for a long time, and we've yes. never, in recent memory anyway, realized having that, those numbers be equal, and this was the first time, and, and really want to thank Ms. Cunningham, her team, as well as principals who do a lot of the hiring, and other folks as well, directors, uh, for realizing that. Can you talk about some of the components you think that have, where you feel like you've made, that have made the, uh, the, the components of the things you're doing, um, what do you think's had the most impact, and what areas are you still paying attention to try to see how we can improve. Okay. Before I answer that, I sure. just want to make sure to note that um, when you look at the increases in the numbers, I want people to also understand that that um, we are not just hiring people, we are also growing people from within our district. So we have had um, custodial staff who have moved up into administration. We've had um, teachers, as Demo uh, Paris, as Damani mentioned, who have moved up to become teacher of record in a classroom. So we're always looking for the opportunity to grow with from within. Mm -hmm. um, and now to answer your question, mm -hmm. when we look at the training that HR is doing with the hiring and um, interview process, there's one comment that we always make, and it's to tell people to look at soft skills. We can't teach people soft skills. We can't teach people to like kids, right? We can't teach them to be kind to kids. That We can't teach them that passion. They have to have it. And to be able to look beyond um, a person using jargon, right, because that's a bias that people have, like, oh, they're not sounding like I would sound if I was doing the interview or answering that question. And to look beyond that and actually hear, really listen to what the person is saying that, I think, has been a big um, change in how people are perceived and the opportunities that people are given to be at the table and to even be able to move forward to the next steps. Thank you. 
Other questions? So when we look, these are our um, increases. Now what's remarkable about those numbers is that even though we have lost staff, and yes, we have lost staff of color, that we still are increasing in our numbers of people who are willing to come to the district and who are, we are able to recruit into the district and people who do decide to stay. The numbers in parentheses are the staff and then the numbers outside of the parentheses are the percentages of students. So you see um, at the top, like African American from the beginning, 2016-17 uh, to 2020, you see that our African American staff actually outnumbers in the region side our student percentages. We still have work to do hmm. in many categories, but we're, we're doing the work. And like I said, our retention rates, we're working on it, you know. Um, there were things that were taking place before, and um, people left. But there are also people who are saying, you know what, the district is moving in the right direction, and I'd like to stay and support it. Just also want to note, um, in terms of the dip for this year, um, some of you may remember that um, we had an unusually high number of retirees last year. Um, our retiree event last spring had, like, packed the room because there were so many people and so that does affect the retention rate and um, you know if you if you pull that out the data looks pretty consistent um, 87.5 is about the state average so 90.8 was you know as a relative number a relative percentage quite a bit above and and really the increase in retirements reflects that 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 dip reflects the retirements not staff members who didn't retire who no longer work in the district now, we put, oh. I was just curious when I was looking at this earlier today at the bottom it has male percent. Right. Did the female get, get in cut there. off on the page? So the reason why there's data about males is because we had a community member who was concerned that we were not looking to hire or increase the diversity of having males in our community. And if you see, we have increased the number of men that are hired, and our numbers still outrank the state's number of hmm. males in, in the teaching okay. profession. Right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we, we do get a lot of criticism as to what we uh, report on and what we don't report on. So it may be said that we're not reporting on the number of LGBTQ members in our community, but that's not a, in our uh, staff, but that's not a question that we are legally able to ask. So that's not a number that I can actually put up there. So I just want okay. everyone to know that. Um, okay. It might be said that we don't um, appreciate transgender, and that is not a true narrative either. That is just not something that we can report on legally. That's useful. It's good to understand that. Thank you. Okay. So our continued goals is to continue um, with the hiring and retention of qualified staff. Now, when we talked about Dr. Morris's goals at the beginning of the year, I, I mentioned uh, you know the hiring part. As long as the community continues to be accepting and welcoming and you know an open place for people to want to come to, that's not going to be the hard part. The hard part is the retention if we don't fix the culture. So we are working on the culture so that we can get the retention part down. Um, we have the Alana staff that we are working with to have them mentor new Alana mm -hmm. staff members. Was there a question? <laughs> okay, so we have the Alana staff, and we are working with them to create action plans on how they are going to provide mentorship. Um, there's a subgroup that will be working with the hiring. There's a subgroup that will be looking at curriculum. There's a subgroup that will be looking at um, just the culture. And, you know, we have four different subgroups with, with our Alana staff members. Um, we're looking at the, the RJ program, you know, thank you. Caridad for that. So we are looking at that. We have used it. We have trained staff. There are more staff who are willing to be trained and more staff who would like to know about it and use it too. So we're looking to increase the numbers of people who not only are trained, but who are using it and able to train. Um, there's continued work that needs to be done when it comes to social justice. This is a district that had a reputation previously and, and probably still for not being welcoming to people of color. And so we still have a lot of work to do. And so <clears throat> with that being said, 
currently we've only used the November 5th curriculum day, half day, mm -hmm. as our training. And then we've tried to work in different schools in just trying to do things for the people of color in that school and to help the staff members to be more welcoming in each school. But now I want to add another training half day. Um, and we'll just revamp the, look at the hiring process again because now it's been two years. We've seen where the results have led, and so we're going to look at joining, um, forming another committee to review that and see mm -hmm. is this taking us where we want to go? Can we do it better? So in about May or June, I'll be calling for people to come and assist mm -hmm. and be part of a committee. And then the one thing that when I looked at the SETF goals years ago. Mm -hmm that I really have not had an, a chance to make an effect on is with students. So when it talks about the AP placements and such, I have a lot of great ideas on mm -hmm. what to do, but I've had, because of the other work, I did not have a chance yet to have an effect on that. And so the goal is to get there, to start um, having that effect on actual students. Right now we're working on the adults who are working with students, but I want to also get mm -hmm. to the students. Any questions? Great. Questions? Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for this presentation. It's very detailed information, Rich, which is which is excellent uh, reflection of the work you and your team have done. And I just want to thank your, your team for coming here too. I think, you know, compared to structurally and in terms of people and leadership that we have today versus a few years ago, it's uh, it's almost night and day. And so it's, it's just, it's great to see. Um, so when you talked about retention, um, you know, you're so right that recruitment and retention is like the, the two, two halves of the equation, right? Um, do, we have, do we do anything specifically when staff are onboarding for the first time? You talked about culture and how, you know, if someone just starts, um, if there's going to be, you know, a disconnect or a challenge, it might happen in those first days or weeks. Um, how, does, how does HR support um, staff in buildings like on their, in their first, as they're first coming on, you know, on board our district? Mentoring. That's one of the big ways that we've been able to um, affect them. And uh, when Mike, when Dr. Morris has his <laughs> principal's meeting, we are, one of the things that are um, constant on the agenda is they're talking about the culture and what they're doing to create a welcoming culture. Because it's not just, uh, you know, sorry to say, it's not just HR who has to create that culture. It's every person's responsibility, as long as you work in this district, it is your responsibility to help the next person to want to be here. And then there are principals who know that there are some people who um, struggle with that, and so they can assist those people to, to help them to be more welcoming. And so like I mentioned, when it comes to the hiring and interview and screening, we can't teach people, once again, those soft skills, those welcoming skills. We are looking for people to come with us and join us in that process who have those skills. Thank you. Great. Other questions, Mr. Fox? Yeah, a couple of questions and a comment, if I may. Um, what percentage of students of color um, graduate in four years? That's a good question. <laughs> and I don't have the answer to it. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> so, but that's do you know I that? Share the committee. I can, I don't Do have you know the lives. percentage of st students of color who are in currently in AP classes? So last year I did a presentation that had the um, the students of color, and the trajectory would have been able if you were there for that, you would have seen the trajectory to answer that question. So when you're asking a student specific question or questions about student data, I don't have student data. I just have staff data with me today. Just one comment, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about the um, restorative justice proposal that's been put forth, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I would like to ask the committee to reconsider it. I'm not sure if it's possible this year. Um, my cohorts in Leverett probably don't want to hear that. Um, but certainly put as a priority for next year. So. I'm just curious how we're doing on licensure. Is all staff and administrators now licensed in where, the, where they're working? So I will definitely say that the administrators that are in front of our staff and students are licensed or on a waiver, which is like a DESE license. DESE okayed right. them to be there. And the staff members are, um, the, the majority are licensed or on a waiver. So the reason for the waivers this year are we are having a lot of people who are moving in from another state or some from another um, 
territory. And so because they don't have the Massachusetts license, we have to work with them to get the Massachusetts license. They're licensed in their previous um, location, but we have to work with them. To yeah, get Massachusetts them. is one of the worst. It doesn't go with, it doesn't like to be with anybody else. Mm -hmm. It's a standalone state. Other questions? Can I just say, please, yes, please, that if you have a question, I really want to hear it because you know, back, I, I, I tell Dr. Morris this, that back in November of 2017, <laughs> I mentioned that there were unlicensed administrators. And then all of a sudden, this whole thing blew up right yeah. after that. And it seemed like I didn't say a word during that meeting. So I would prefer if you guys ask a question now so that nothing blows up later and you say, I didn't know when Doreen <laughs> sat here and, you know, did all the talking. That is, that is, a, oh. very, that is a very <laughs> fair statement. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, you, you said you said a moment ago. So you said all the administrators are licensed or on uh, a waiver that's been appropriately applied for and received and all that. And then you said the majority of staff are either. I, I guess I'd like I'd love a, re a rephrasing of that, a recharacterization, or re answering of that question so because the way you said it didn't make it clear whether or not um, non-administrative staff were actually whether they're all appropriately licensed mm -hmm. or on a waiver or whether there's a third category right so there is a third category meaning that we applied for the waiver and Desi might have requested some more information so I don't want to tell you that they're all on a waiver yeah. when we are still submitting information to Desi waiting for um, approval. Okay, so now I'll ask a question that seems appropriate in our, our little way back machine of <laughs> how people ask these questions. Uh, is uh, do you feel confident and do you have a communication plan to ensure that all since the since the obligation for licensure is on the staff people not actually on you um, is is there a good do you feel like you have a good communication uh, process to ensure that those staff who are needing to follow up with DESI or hearing from DESI are actually following up expeditiously? Yes. Um, the reason I can say that confidently is that DESI has also reached out to us with the letter as to what is required. And so we are also following up with the staff, and then we're the ones submitting the actual document to DESI. Okay, great. Ms. Sullivan? Yeah, I get, uh, um, uh, the finance director, we, hi we approved his hiring on a waiver, and the word was that by the end of January he would be licensed. Is that true? I can, I can do that one. Okay. Um, so he uh, has completed all the documents are being reviewed and needs to be signed off on, um, but all the documents are in place. Um, and as you may know from your own experience, it, sometimes when you send things in, it doesn't uh, there's not like a FedEx delivery back of um, a response, um, yeah. but all the requirements have been met. <laughs> yeah. And I just want everyone to also know and understand that waivers are valid until June 30th of the school year. So even if Desi decides until, you know, June 27th, he's still on a waiver and he's still perfectly no. fine to operate in the I district. Was, I was just curious yeah. if, it had, if it had come through. Yeah. Okay. Right. I'll ask him personally next time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> is there anything else you want to make sure we ask about? <laughs> I, think we don't. I mean, I, I mean, I do think in a, in a, I don't know if we can do it this year um, still, but I think whether it's this year or next, I mean, I think, I think the, the other, we've had other presentations and asked about the, the trend in like discipline rates and types of discipline right. and things like that. I think, I think any, I think any of those presentations and similar to this one, there's always a question out there. The public's always interested, and I think the committee would always be interested in knowing. So I think even if it's if it's possible, even for later this year, it'd be great to see a, a, maybe a less less big, less robust, you know, some kind of an update. Right. So the discipline data, I usually, I won't say usually because I only did it once. Um, yeah. We report on that about May, June, so that we have the whole year's worth of That's when it was. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Well, that'd be great. That'd be wonderful to hear again. Uh, any further any further questions or comments from the committee? And thank you. Thank you to your office. Thanks for you coming and presenting.
Great. What are we on next? Uh, statement of Interest, Middle School Roof. Dr. Morris, you have... So I apologize. The, uh, in your packet, the vote language and the summary is accurate, but for some reason the, uh, the attachment was last year's Statement of Interest, and many of you may not have noticed when it was emailed because it's pretty darn identical to this <laughs> year's. Um, not much has changed in the roof other than it's a year older. Um, oh, and which, which is a good thing with the state. It is yeah. a good thing. Also, with the Student Opportunity Act, MSBA having more funds is a good thing. So uh, the way this works from a process perspective is in your packet, it's about four pages in. You'll see a summary. Um, but there's one odd thing. The MSBA has a very odd uh, template and uh, so it explains that it's and it also has required MSBA vote language uh, which has to be identical to what's voted tonight. Mm -hmm. The submission is due on Friday, this Friday the 14th and we won't have updated minutes that are get voted by, by now. You might see that language and the MSBA is willing to accept draft minutes that have been verified and confirmed and signed off on by the chair. So we're gonna, just going to put a little bit of a rush on Cielo. So sorry, Cielo, um, <laughs> in terms of minutes. But uh, we'll get those and make sure that the chair signs off on them by the end of the week so it gets submitted. Uh, but what you see is very similar to what was voted on by the regional school committee last year. Um, so while it was a mistake, it's it, not too big a mistake because the, the content has not significantly changed. Dr. Morris or Dr. Slaughter, can you find where the language is that needs to be left? It's, it's in the packet. Oh, it's in, uh, yeah. it's in the packet. I thought you were saying it was in this. Nope, it's in the packet. Sorry oh, okay. if I said that. I also misunderstood. Is there anything? Um, Mr. Roy Clark is here. If there's any clarifying questions about the content of the statement of interest, he uh, is available to answer any questions you might have. Everything on your mind you want to say? Yes, about the roof. <laughs> uh, so, um, the, the significant changes in this year from last year, other than updating all the ages by a year, um, is that we changed the language um, about uh, the approval process. Since, uh, since it was already approved, the, um, the borrowing authority was already approved by this school committee last year and by the four towns. We changed the language there, and I think that will help us out. Mm -hmm. Um, and the only other um, significant change is that we took out language about um, layoffs and, and staff reductions because it's been over a year since that happened. Right. Thank you. Any questions? Um, you mentioned the motion language has to be exact. Do you mean it has to sound like I move that resolved having convened in an open? I think the... It's, it just reads weird. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I meant the once you start saying having convened in an open meeting, not the resolve part. My apologies. I wasn't just clear. Asking the technicality. He's really just asking for personal curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not even. No, it's it may or may not be relevant to nice meeting. Artistic relevance. <laughs> <laughs> are there, I guess, are there other questions about? I guess you can ask about the motion if you want, but I really sort of mean about the. I mean, we've talked a lot about the need to do the roof, and we've also talked a lot about the need to do the roof ideally with state matching funds or maybe even only with state matching funds. Uh, we've, and separately, we've talked about doing studies and work and design to try to figure out if we can do solar. And we have talked this year about maybe the best thing to do isn't to do solar on the roof, but to do it nearby. So all the stuff we've talked about. I guess also, every once in a while, I know Mr. Demlin will pipe up in a meeting and say to the audience at home, uh, when we're about to move to potentially a quick vote, it's like, no, 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 we talked about this a lot. It's not, <laughs> this isn't the first time we've discussed it. Um, I'm happy to, to acknowledge anyone who feels like reading. Go. Um, I move that having convened in an open meeting on February 11th, 2020, prior to the SOI submission closing date, the School Committee of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the Statement of Interest form dated February 11, 2020, for the Amherst Regional Middle School located at 170 Chestnut Street, 
Amherst, Massachusetts 01002, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the priority category for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future replacement of the roof, which has been failing at a higher rate in recent years, and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance of the, or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. It moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor uh, signify aye by raising your hand. It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Nakajima will be in touch about just certifying the, the minutes and there'll be, as yeah. I remember, oh no, you're not the Amherst. Oh, you did it last what? year. There's an electronic form that gets emailed to you that you have to. Okay, but, whatever. But just I, I can so also, come, I also come by and sign yeah. in person, whatever you want me to do. Thank you. Um, Review of the four town meeting and FY21 budget hearing. So we're going to have a little bit of a presentation and then we're going to open up the hearing. Right? Yeah. And so I'm going to do uh, more of an introduction than I typically would because I, you know, the agenda was uh, designed intentionally to do both talk about the four town meeting as well as talk about the regional budget. So um, the four town meeting we had on February 1st, um, very similar information to what's presented here was presented at that four town meeting. Uh, my summary of the four town meeting was that there was a lot of goodwill towards um, the district for understanding the financial situations that the towns were in. There was not yet uh, consensus or agreement on which assessment methodology um, to play out and and so I appreciated that there was I make that distinction intentionally because I think it's important to note that the towns were highly supportive of the schools in my opinion again I'm just speaking for myself uh, however um, the cost sharing or that's layman's terms or the kind of assessment methodology used that determines the assessments for each town each four town uh, was a, a, a tricky balance and it was um, a hard thing I also want to note this is a budget hearing so if um, you know uh, if at the end of the hearing, if anyone, you know, I think that'll be open comment from the public because it is a hearing. What? So this is a budget hearing? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. So just, that means it will at some point be opening up for public yeah. comments during the hearing. It was a little bit of a non sequitur. I apologize. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was trying to figure out where you're going with that. I it's like, isn't that the definition of a hearing? It is. All right. um, and I think the only other thing I'll add before I turn it to, to Dr. Slaughter was that this is pretty similar. The one difference that you'll notice in this budget proposal versus the what was presented at Fort Town meeting was the ads cuts uh, have much more specificity to, well, there's not that many of them actually, but they do have more specificity to them than what was presented at the Fort Town meeting because of where we were in our process. And when right. we get to that slide, I'll be able to talk about them in, in greater detail. With that, I'll turn it to Dr. Slaughter. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I assume the yes. it works, right? So this presentation is not wildly different than what you saw on Saturday. If you had gone to the meeting, it's not a lot different from what you saw the last time we spoke about it. Um, this slide in particular is almost identical. Um, I will say, uh, you know, these things are all still true uh, by and large. What is different a little bit is uh, the second sort of large bullet point there about the overall budget increase of 1.54. Um, there are a couple of pieces of information regarding our health insurance uh, and the, the rate of increase in our health insurance for the coming year, which is a little less than we had, had put into uh, our calculations for this number, and then also uh, some updated information relative to regional transportation aid, uh, both of which um, help uh, the revenue side of things, uh, essentially, and so therefore lower that overall budget increase a little bit uh, relative to what the towns are, are charged. Um, and so I think that that you know helps all of the uh, uh, regional school member member towns in, in affording uh, to pay their assessment for the for the coming year. Um, and again, we're still you know the uh, we're still trying to be responsive to the, the information we got both earlier in the year, early in the school year, and as well as last week, and, and trying to meet the needs of, of each of the, the the four communities as far as their ability to meet the assessment. Um, 
And again, you know, our budget for the coming year is, is going to do the things we've been doing, which is you know, keeping our staff, which you just heard about who those people are and, and what we do to make them and keep them highly qualified and, 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 uh, and, and engage our, our community with the Family Center, the Bright Program, restorative practices that we have in place now and ones we're trying to build over, over time, keeping our class sizes in order and, and offering a wide variety of, of programs and, and opportunities for kids outside of the, the classroom. Um, we've kept the reduction over the last, uh, since the last meeting, the same as far as what we know we need and, and know we can pull out of next year's uh, planning. Um, and the proposed budget, that actually, those numbers are a little different. And, and we'll, this will be what was, is on the slide that you'll see. But I think if, if we have the moment, we'll, we'll pull up a, a, a more updated slide in, in a few moments. And I think, you know, one of the, I'm sorry, one other thing I want to mention is that uh, on the agenda we talked about having an additional hearing set in March because these are moving um, targets. Mm -hmm. And so I think just for Dr. Slaughter and the committee, I think we could stick to this presentation with that note um, because, you know, everything happens very quickly, you know, including just even this morning with, you know, getting more information, you know, health insurance, all these other factors uh, all have an impact on the on this. So um, I think we'll, we'll stick to this and when we get to dialogue we can answer more questions about what, what potentially has changed and will continue to change from here on out. Right. Yeah. So relative to that and, and just saying this slide is, is uh, you know, indicating how things are changing in the, in the large areas that we have. Um, the one change will be that the orange health insurance bar will be a little shorter. Um, but it's still a dominant factor in our, our budget. It, 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 even being smaller than it is shown here, it is still a very dominant piece of our, our budgeting and, it, and our concern around budgeting. And when we talk about the second quarter report, I'll talk to that issue uh, again. Um, moving ahead, this is just the schedule we're under. Um, currently, we're, we're on the budget hearing. Um, and then we'll get into uh, March, and we'll, we'll look at adopting a budget. And we'll hopefully be able to lock in a little tighter on some of these numbers. And so we'll have things moving a little less. Um, over time, uh, just talking about the budget process to remind you all again, we, we start this process in October and November and start, you know, uh, reviewing with staff what their needs are going to be, uh, thinking about how our, our programming and, and our offerings are going to change. And then we get into November, December, January, we try to get information uh, from the state about what their support's going to look like, what um, is... Uh, available from each of the communities around their resources to, to support the budget. Uh, and then then we come to you guys in, in late January with the first first presentation of the budget. We come to our hearing phase, which is where we are now, and then we'll we'll go ahead into our, our actual vote in March. Um, so this is a the uh, a picture of the revenue budget. And again what I'll point out here there's a number of assessment methods that we're showing. Um, Across the across the multicolored uh, uh, diagram there, and and so the first two columns are fiscal 19 and fiscal 20, and then we everything else to the right of that in color is is for the coming year, and you'll note that the uh, the funded budget is at 32 million 661 thousand 875 after taking out the reductions in in the budget. Uh, it's a 1.54 percent increase. Um, we have a number of sources from the state and other areas that, that are, uh, reduce the burden on each of the member communities. And then as we get to the bottom section, we see what assessments are required based on those different assessment mo models and methodologies that we have. Um, and so uh, in the a year ago, uh, I think there was some agreement to have a two-year plan of, a, of approach with a 30 percent uh, use of the statutory method and then go to 40 percent this year. Um, there's been ongoing dialogue around that, and so it, it, it is going to be our recommendation to you to look at the 45 percent um, method for funding funding this. And, and as I hinted at earlier, the, the numbers there are a little different from what are, you're seeing on the screen. You know, they will essentially approve for, for everyone as far as that's concerned. Um, and so I think that, you know, it will ultimately play out uh, in a, in a fairly favorable way for, for all the communities to be able to afford uh, the assessments that we're, we're seeking to support the budget. Um, if we move uh, ahead here now, we've, we've taken that 45% uh, uh, statutory method and, and used that and applied it to a, a more standard look of our revenue budget, where we show a few more years in the past. Uh, the fiscal 21 is, is posed there, and we also have projections for 22 and 23, which assume some inflationary factors and that sort of thing. And, and so 
uh, you get a sense of how this year fits within multiple years uh, worth of, of uh, projections relative to revenue and, and, and the like. Um, but again, essentially the same information we had on the previous slide, but just with a single type of assessment methodology applied. Um, again, you'll see over time, you'll see that our, our current year, we're, we're showing here 1.54, is very much in keeping with the, with the kind of increases on a year-over-year -year basis that we've shown for the last few years. And so it's very much in keeping with uh, the trend we've had relative to that. Yeah. So. <coughs> on to the, sure. Oh. Do we want to? I think we can, there's a question we can come back to. It. Yeah. yeah, so this extent, expenses in broad categories here of, of what we're going at, and, and, and so again, the 1.54% is what we're seeing in, in fiscal 21 relative to fiscal 20. Yeah, and I think the, there's the one thing to note is that 322000 there, that's the difference between what would be a level service budget increase, which is 2.5%, and where we're at. So when we think about level services, that's we take what we have this year, we roll everything forward, and everything stays the same. And so we're $322,000 less than that amount. I think it's just an important thing to note when we're in these budget conversations that, um, that inflation goes up, salaries go up, as they should, right? None of that's a critique. And so we're in a position of trying to make things work with less funding, um, relative to this year's budget as we have, you know, next year. And, and so that, that's our challenge. Right. You know, we get to add cuts. I just didn't, wanted to note that. Right. And as we, and that's a nice segue to the next slide where we talk about a couple of, of things in particular where we talk about our salaries. So these are negotiated. We are, our contracts currently uh, are in place until January, uh, January, June 30th of 2021. And so we're, we know what those steps and colas look like for the coming year. Um, but it, our overall increase in salaries uh, is 2.23%, is so that includes known retirements, changes in staffing, et cetera, et cetera, that we put into, into the mix. And our expense accounts are up about 415, almost 416,000, which is 2.89%. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, health insurance is, is one of the primary drivers of, of that change from a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, there are some other things, obviously, that play into that, but that's one of those uh, primary pieces of the, of the puzzle that we're looking at very closely each and every year. And so as we look at the, uh, this is, I'll let yeah. Dr. Morris talk to this piece a little bit more where we get into the specifics of how we got that 322000 Yep. So uh, I'll go into each of these. So uh, last year we had a capital stabilization fund. So what that was was $60,000 from the operating budget that we put into a stabilization fund to fund future improvements, particularly looking for looking at the track and the fields. And so that money is sitting there. It's not going anywhere until we take action on it. But you know, in this, in this fiscal climate, we're not able to have another contribution to that fund. Uh, we're being conservatives with this year's budget. You'll see that with the second quarter budget update. And we feel confident that we can prepay retirement incentives that are contractually guaranteed, but can be either paid on June 30th or July 1st. So this would be paying those on June 30th, which reduces next year's costs. Uh, to staff turnover, just these are known retirements um, that will, um, you know, we assume a certain um, step and uh, education level of new hires. So we assume $41,000 in saving that way. Uh, there were no sabbatical requests. Uh, contractually, we have to build in a sabbatical um, each year in, in, in this district. And since there were no requests, there were none to consider, and we can reduce that budget line. The alternative funding source is the UMass um, piece that I mentioned earlier. So that'll be, we're still working the final numbers, but that'll be about $15,000 for the region, uh, the regional share of that. And thanks to our university partners for that. So budget addition, um, there's only one. It's a relatively minor addition of a 0.2 position in math for $13,000. And that's to address, um, and I think we talked about this at the last meeting, but I, I think it's worth me saying again, that we have a, a group of students uh, in our math sequence who we don't have a course that's really designed for them. We're around credit recovery, uh, making sure they're on track to graduate. And so our you know, traditional course sequence doesn't allow for that level of flexibility. And we're realizing that we're, we need to serve students better. And while it's not a huge number, they're a critical number. It gets back to the question Mr. Fonch asked perhaps earlier about graduation percentage, which, you know, very frankly, our graduation percentage is really high. And it's not 100. And we want it to be higher than it is. And so Principal Jones has, has worked in multiple high schools and, and recognizes this need for uh, an in-between course in mathematics to support students, um, particularly as they're in 10th and 11th grade. So that's the only add-on here. 
So the budget reductions is last year we talked a lot about math, speaking of math, and uh, this reduces the implementation of the um, implementation support for the new curriculum in math grades 7 through 12. It says 6 on here, but it's just acknowledgement that it, uh, the new curriculum was grade 6 through 12. This was originally a 0.8 cut if you, when it was first proposed based on feedback from the committee at the last meeting. It was reduced to a 0.6 cut, uh, which um, preserves, you know, preserve 0.4 of that role for the, the region next year. So it is a reduction of, of half because it's, it's currently a 0.8 role in the um, region. Some of that's because we're covering it from grants. So the math of it is moving 0.2 of it to Title IIA grant and then maintaining 0.2 of that position here. And so um, we, I heard loud and clear, we heard loud and clear the committee's concerns about the kind of steep drop in that position. And within this current budget climate, we're able to reduce the percentage cut of that position. The high school world language, uh, point four. So again, these aren't cuts. No, we never talk about cuts we want to make. They're cuts that we feel like in this, you know, given the dollar amount we have to make. And uh, this will um, have an impact. And, and Mr. Sadiq at the high school is working on exact numbers. You can't really get exact numbers to a student's register, but about the implication on class size uh, for students at the high school. Um, some of this is just a reflection that we do have declining enrollment and um, world language um, comparatively hasn't had as deep reductions as class sizes, as enrollment has declined as other departments. Uh, there's one fewer paraeducator needed. That's just based on student need at the high school. That's not a, that's, you know, could ar arguably been reductions, but we put it in budget reductions. Um, could have been adjustments, excuse me, but we put in the reductions category. And looking to reduce our administrative costs whenever we can, and we think we've identified $30,000 there. So the net, um, if you look at net additions and reductions, so the net uh, reduction would be a shade over to uh, FTE. Um, it totals to a reduction of $322,000, and that's where we are with our ads and cuts list right now at the current time. We'd love to have nothing on the reductions list, to be very clear. Um, the paraeducator perhaps would stay because that's, that's a student-based need, but the others will have an impact, but we tried to find the areas would have the least impact on students, um, and, and that's sort of what, what we had to do in this budget year. Uh, Dr. Morris, my recollection is that the purpose of this item in general is actually to introduce and then open up a hearing. Yeah. So um, I'm just I'm saying that as a reminder that our next step is not to go into a bunch of questions from the committee and comments from the committee, but actually, but but I but if there's questions that the committee has that they think would help, or even comments that they think might clarify and, right. and support public understanding of what you've said. I think that would be helpful. So I'm just reminding the committee, we're not opening up to debate amongst the committee members and discussion and comments, but if there's something you think would be helpful, uh, I will recognize you now. Mr. Donald. I, I think this is a clarifying question. It's more clarifying what I think you said yeah. about yeah. the math curriculum. So am I correct in hearing that you said that it's currently a point eight position, not a one position? It's currently point eight at the region. At the region. And that going for this year this um some of the that position will be um, co covered by a grant as opposed to with within the spending yeah so 2.2 would be in the title 2a grant title 2a is a grant that's focused on professional development for for staff um that's you know at the exclusion of something else to be fair but uh we we really feel like it's valuable and then 0.2 would be retained from the appropriated budget so a total of 0.4 or 40 percent of someone's job would be to work on that at grade seven through 12. So 40 percent as opposed to 80 percent. Yeah. Okay. And I'll be honest that you know we wanted to fade it, and that seems like I appreciate the feedback that I received from the committee members from committee members last time, and that feels like a reasonable year two of an implementation as we fade the support. Thank you. Okay. Any any other of those kind of questions, sir? Um. I'm sure the community will be curious about this as well. I was just wondering if you can give any indication of which language will be affected by the world language, and if um, you can, if if it will potentially take, will it limit <coughs> our the number of languages that we're offering? So we're not intending to, we will not limit the number of languages. It's really until students, particularly eighth, current eighth grade students, register for languages at the high school. It's, it's hard to be explicit about which language. So when mm -hmm. we come back in March, um, you know the 
kind of information nights in late February. We'll have a lot more information. I think I'll be able to share a lot more on March 10th. Um, but the students drive the FTEs mm -hmm. in this regard. And um, <coughs> since we don't, we have a quarter of the students who we don't have information about. And some also, just the way it works to get a little more detailed, because I think it's a good question informationally, is that students who take, for instance, I'll just choose, well, any language, um, they may take, let's say Spanish, because it's easier to talk about, Spanish 1A in seventh grade, and they take Spanish 2A in eighth grade, uh, or 1B, let me start over. Spanish 1A in, in seventh grade, Spanish 1B in eighth grade, they'll be ready for Spanish 2 when they're in ninth grade. Some students don't take a language in middle school and start with Spanish 1 or any other language 1 when they get to high school. So it's not just you can look at the scatter plot of what eighth graders are taking because there's a whole other decision process that goes on. Do they want to stay with the current language? Mm -hmm. Do they want to start a new language? Have they not taken a language? Do they want to start a language? So that's where when we get into like the first and second level of any of our languages, it gets a little complicated to predict because we're, we're trying not to force them in any direction. Mm -hmm. More students than you would expect, than I expect, change language from eighth to ninth. It's, it's actually really surprising. There you go. Um, okay. uh, any further clarifying questions? And is that the presentation or is there more? Um, there's just a quick on the capital, which I think I can just roll through. You know, Absolutely. we did it last time. So there's nothing changed from the four town meeting um, that uh, we've looked at buildings, grounds, um, and potential grants, but really buildings and grounds. Uh, some of the major projects, the uh, air conditioning, the chiller replacement at the middle school, um, we have wide variance in temperature, room to room. And then some of that's just because our chillers are um, beyond their useful life, and that's the, um, the most significant variables. There's been a request for the field improvements to be um, the study for those, to be not funded from the appropriated or even capital budget. Uh, that the region asks for, but through a different process, um, the Community Preservation Act or CPA funds, and that process is continuing. Some of the other ones that are uh, highlighted on the document or shaded on the paper copy uh, are out of revolving funds uh, or other sources, so um, they don't hit the capital budget for the towns. We know that the roof project is a major capital project for the towns to fund. We know the athletic fields will be a major capital project for the towns to uh, fund. <laughs> And we've heard both at four town meeting and I've heard offline some concerns from some of the member towns about um, how to afford capital projects moving forward with those two really significant needs uh, being met. So we're trying to take care of the things that need to get taken care of uh, in an expeditious way, but also recognizing the town's fiscal capacity to take on major projects while those two are going to hit their books. Great. Is that a fair summary? It is. The only other thing I would add is I would, I'll note that it says financing next to uh, the 410000 for buildings and the 15000 which in other terms would be borrowing. So if people are wondering about, well, how much are we going to borrow next year, that would be the amount that would be added to the, to the debt burden that we have uh, in, in the coming year. And that's played out in this, this slide, which has what the assessments are. And so when the assessments go uh, up to, in total, 449700 52, it's taking into account that that increased amount of borrowing um, as well as the pre-existing borrowing that we're continuing to pay off over time. I just want to add that. Okay. Anything else? Any further clarifying questions, Mr. Sullivan? I just want to point out that <coughs> $15,000 for the girls' locker room renovation, yeah. isn't, that's for planning that the actual renovation isn't until 2025. And the boys' locker room was renovated between 2014 and 2016. Thank you. <coughs> Your advocacy could help move that up. <coughs> working, working on trying to soften up the new finance director. Anything they can do would be I good. softened up the last one enough that the 15000 made it on there <laughs> after five years. So I'm you, you have, You've been mentioning that the entire time I've been on yeah, school five committees. Years. Well, I've talked about you've been on school committee, but it's our time I've been on. Uh, and I wish you luck in getting it moved up. Yeah. Dr. Morris? And, and to that point, uh, and it's, I, I want to say something, you know, I know kind of you're saying that and you're right and you've advocated for it. And, and uh, it, I think it's really important to note that there's a lot more things to do if we had more funding coming our way. And, and I'm not making excuse for the past, and I agree with what you said, Mr. Sullivan. And, and I'm not saying towns can afford to pay us to, to afford more, but I think the advocacy um, that I would push, you know, very frankly, and uh, I don't mean to be too forward, but the committee is that if we, we have a long list of capital projects, 
and if there's a perception that we need to move faster on them, uh, we're happy to move faster. Oh, no, I'm you just know. thanking. Oh no, 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 no it, absolutely. Get it on the list. No, that's... absolutely. No, and we. Are, I'm serious about appreciating your advocacy, but I do want to just say that that's the conversation that perhaps need to occur. As staff members, we're working within a budget that we're hearing from elected officials in four communities that they can afford. If that number changes, you won't hear an argument from this side of the table. That's all I'm suggesting. Well, yeah. The same thing with the athletic fields. Like if I get a chance, I'll pop in and say, oh, yeah, can. that track can't be resurfaced. It needs to be replaced. Yeah, well, we appreciate your advocacy. Turn so that the soccer field, and the poor goalie can see. But I'd also, I'd also remind people that that's in the public as well, that the reason we've reoriented our calendar of meetings and when we take up issues is so that we can, we can better engage at the appropriate moment in depth the issues we're facing. So that's just an example. We had a we've had a couple of long conversations about our athletic fields and facility planning and what that entails, because we know we we know we need to have a broader conversation than just what we can do at this table, and that's a part of doing that. Another part of doing that is having a hearing on the budget. <laughs> and every year there's this uncomfortable moment where it seems like we talk, and forgive me for saying this, no. it's all useful, but we talk endlessly and then hear a little bit. Um, and so it's, it's an endemic issue. Um, I would love to open the hearing. Thank you. And just, so, again, I know you did so earlier, but just remind the public who so you I'm are. I'm Caridad Martinez, and I am a community member, and um, actually, I actually live in Belchertown, but my family lives here in Amherst, my family here, and I'm on the Equity Task Force. Um, so, yeah, wow, okay. It is hard to understand, as a, as a community member, what's going on. So I appreciate some of the clarifications, but I want to go back to additions and reductions. And so, um, tell me a little more, can you explain just a little more why the professional developed around math? Why, what, what was the the thinking behind the reduction? The thinking... Please. Okay. Uh, the thinking behind the reduction was that we had a budget number to meet and that we feel passionately about um, the curriculum we, we are teaching and the potential positive impact on students uh, for all the reasons we talked about. Um, and you were at some of these meetings last year, Caridad. And, um, and yet, when we think about impact on students, um, it, it's, it's less direct. Uh, and if the budget was different, we would not be making this reduction. You know, and that's my honest answer to your honest question. You mean that the curriculum is less direct, less doesn't directly affect the students in a way that you think it should? Yeah. Let me, let me be, clarify. I apologize for that, if it's OK. Please. Um, yeah, so the role uh, works with adults and not students. So we all know the importance, and you heard a presentation earlier about the impact of professional development uh, that it has on the experience of students. And so in the second year of implementation, um, when we're looking at what we need to reduce, not what we want to reduce, we tried to balance things that were direct service to students, and there are some things that are direct service to students, as well as some things that are less direct. And so if you're asking me to justify it, I agree wholeheartedly that I would prefer this cut not to be on here. Uh, and I'm working with the budget that we are hoping to get passed. Okay. Yeah. I still have a lot of questions about that, but we'll move on. I might be able to get answers maybe later on a little. Okay, so world language. Um, so when I see world language, I just, the first thing that comes to my mind is like world language is something that has to do with equity, it, it, with diversity. Maybe not equity, but maybe. But diversity. So um, so why that and not something else? So some of the things I don't see here in reductions that I, as a community member, having listened to um, other critiques from the public and the community around how the, the administration is using their budget, I don't see anything here. And I don't know if in staffing and supplies, but I, I took a look, and so I just have to, now that I have this opportunity that we have a hearing, and I don't think I've ever even spoken in a hearing, so this is great. <laughs> I'm the only one. Ooh. So I'm going to, yeah. So I saw, I have, you know, we have access, and it's public knowledge, to some of the salaries and things, you know. And for me, my first thing is, yeah, everyone needs to get paid good money. We all, everybody in the world, we shouldn't have poverty in this world. We shouldn't, but we know we do. And some people get paid. For example, paraprofessionals, I think that they should be getting paid more money, and they don't. 
especially when they work so closely with students and they're working through you know, much more difficult jobs sometimes than the actual teacher standing up front. Um, so I don't see, uh, and, then, and then I saw other things like, you know, um, cost for um, trips and things like that, that, you know, happen in every school, happen in every job and things like that. So I, I don't see any reductions in that. I, I would have liked to say, okay, you know what? I would like to see reductions in things that, because that seems to me something that is definitely not a direct service to students or to the community, right? A trip here, a trip there, you know, um, and I don't, wanna, I don't wanna trivialize that because when people make those decisions, they think it's a good one and they think it's, you know, I need to go there, it's gonna be important for us. But I'm just wondering if um, I would like to see, and, and whether it's happening or not, I don't know that, but I would like to see the administration um, look at what they prioritize in their budget. In terms of, um, I would like the administration to figure out ways of connecting with the community to find out, well, you know, what, what's your take on the way we are um, looking at our budget? Because I don't think that happens. I think that it happens with the administration and then the board. And I know you are representatives of the community and maybe you go back and speak to some of your community, but there's so many, there's so many people that are left out of that and they may not be in agreement with the way monies are being used. So I see world language, and maybe you can tell me you know, um, why world language, I mean, that's a big cut, 35,000, and what makes that something that's disposable at this moment? You know, and I know, like you said, if you had the money, you wouldn't be cutting anything, but what makes that something that you wanna cut and not Chips to Puerto Rico. <laughs> and I don't mean to trivialize that. I just <laughs> felt like we didn't need to go there. That was something that I felt like, wow, we have a lot of resources here. And how did they get there? I wasn't part of that. So I couldn't offer, you know, but I was looking from the outside and saying, wow, you know, that's, you know, and that actually, you know, it was a, it was a good chunk of money. So that's kind of my, so why world languages and not something else? So, so um, I'm not sure what ground rules we usually set for this. I, I, if there's a clarifying answer you can provide, I think that would be good. Mm -hmm. If it's essentially debating the opinion of the, like in other words, also when you're asking a question, if you have a strong opinion, that's great. What I don't want to get into a situation is in which Dr. Morris is essentially arguing with you about whether your opinion is valid, because the entire point is we're trying to hear from you. And in a future meeting, actually literally the next one, uh, he'd have an opportunity to respond. So if there's anything you want to say that's helpful to clarify, that's it's, great. But I just want to, I, I just I don't mm -hmm. think it's helpful. It's also, it's not even helpful for you that if you want to be heard, if like every time you finish talking, Mike then debates whether, Dr. Morris then debates whether he agrees with you or something. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, don't, I don't think I'm asking for an agreement. I'm asking for like an analysis. Like, so what, why world languages and Sure. You know why? Sure. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying, right? I do. Okay. I do. So I'm not sure I, I did, but we can you can clarify. Maybe you can clarify a little bit what you meant because I'm a little confused. Am I? Because you said something about ground rules, so I just wanted to. No, I'm just I'm. What I say by ground rules is that when you give the public an opportunity to speak, and then you give an opportunity for people who sit on this side of the table to respond to what the public is bringing up there is a natural risk that um, people who are sitting on this side of the table can start, whether it's unintentional or intentional, can start to essentially be debating with the members of the public about what they're trying to do when they're bringing their opinions and their, and their views and their values and their interests and their experiences before us. And so without actually characterizing whether that particular question was in any way problematic, uh -huh. I was simply trying to say, really to Dr. Morris, but also members of the committee, that we're here, we're here to listen. So as you're thinking about how to respond, please try to keep it in that spirit of answering a question, not debating. Yeah, so I'll just, I'll answer very directly. So uh, the way our process works, and, and I think in a prior meeting, Dr. Slaughter talked about this, 
is principals, directors get together, we look at our budget amount, and in this particular instance, I don't disagree with anything you said about world language, uh, the reality was we have declining enrollment in our schools, mm -hmm. and we look at places that uh, perhaps haven't had budget reductions or some budget reductions over the past few years. In fact, world language has had budget increase, uh, at least one budget increase in recent years. And we look to places where we feel like a reduction can be made with the least impact to students. Um, not about, and we're, uh, to Ms. Spitzer's question and my response before, we're not talking about reducing a language. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking at you know, class sizes and maintaining our offering of four languages um, in our schools. So if I didn't have to do it, would I not do it? Absolutely. Um, but that's the process that our principals and directors look at. So, okay. So can you, thanks. So can you tell me a little bit more about um, these budget reductions in terms of staffing, supplies? Can, can you give me some examples of what that means? I'm not quite sure what that. So we're still working through. We're in February, so we're still working through. But I think to the point um, that I mentioned, I tried to mention earlier, is that we always try to see if there are administrative reductions to be made, can we make them, and can we um, still support the goals of the district without them? And we feel like in a variety of areas we can make those reductions. Okay. Um, so so my, my other question was, can you explain a little bit more about like how, how the whole thing about the town budgets? Because that, that's also not something that is very clear from what I, I had a conversation with one of the members uh, of this um, school committee. And so some of the information is that, uh, and I tried to look something up in the media and there was nothing. So I, I mean, maybe I'm just not Googling right. I don't know. <laughs> but um, so there's four towns, there's four budgets. Um, apparently last year or the year before, the towns kind of agreed to, was it an amount or a process? I wasn't quite sure, so if you can clarify that. And then, um, so Amherst is, I believe it was Amherst and another town, two towns were kind of in a, continued with that agreement that was made, and then two other towns were kind of like, well, we don't know, we can. So can you clarify a little more about what that process is and what exactly are these two, two other towns saying about, you know, the, you know what, how much they can give, how much they can? Sure, sure. so. Uh... And anybody can answer that. Too. Right. I can, I can keep going, <laughs> okay. if that's okay with the committee. Uh, so uh, there are different assessment methods. Assessment method, what I mean when I say that or what we mean when we say that is how the costs get um, divided up to each member town. And so I would say over the past five or six years, there's been strong disagreements among the member towns about what is fair. So for some towns, they've advocated for we should pay the same dollar amount per pupil. So if your student's coming from Amherst, Leverett, Shootsbury, Pelham, it should cost, whatever the cost is, it should be even across the communities. And other towns have felt like that's not fair, that there should be some wealth component um, that gets attributed to that. What makes it additionally common? you say wealth component, meaning like the, the percentage of wealth in those towns? The reason I'm speaking in vague terms is how you define wealth in a community is one of the touch points in this debate. So no. I'm, I'm not going to, I can't go further. Most of us from poor working class think this is, well. <laughs> but Dr. Morris, I mean, to, 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 it's pretty simple just to, to us. I, mean, I think for both uh, uh, carried out as well as the public who are watching, right. I mean, so the, the, the district, um, when it combined and created le the legal documents that created our district, in that agreement, which is typically called the regional agreement, all four towns um, agreed to uh, a methodology for you know, charging each town their share of the town costs for educating their kids. Uh, and the, in that agreement, that's sort of like the charter document, it says you'll charge each town like a per, an average per pupil cost for each, each kid. And, and that's what's in the agreement. And so for many, many years, it changed one, 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 a couple times over like the last 50 years or 60 years. But for the most part, it's been that one method for the entire time. Around 25 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, the state created an alternative statutory methodology for apportioning these costs to the, to the individual towns within regional school districts. And what they built into that method was the concept that based on a number of factors, but a lot a big driver is property wealth. Like some towns are just wealthier than others by the value of their property. Doesn't mean you have the income to pay your property taxes, but on, on paper you look like you have a lot of money. Um, and, uh, and they built in the idea that, that it's, it's fair or reasonable to take into account the relative wealth of one town or another 
um, when, when assessing those individual towns. And so what you had is you had um, member towns of the four, t of the four towns uh, who felt like they were getting the short end of the stick, so to speak, by not taking into account wealth, start to advocate for an alternative assessment methodology like the states that would uh, adopt that. And that was like, what, six years ago or something? Something, right. something like something like that, and so so the, the short, the long and the short of it is, over those last six years, the towns have been doing a lot of work. Sometimes arguing, sometimes sitting down and looking over complex spreadsheets and figuring out, is there really a fair way we can do this that would make all the towns happy? The the short the short answer also is that the four towns have failed to ever come up with an alternative methodology that made everyone happy and that made everyone feel like they are being treated fairly. And so what we've been doing is year to year, the towns come up with essentially a one year solution or compromise where we say, okay, we can all live with this for this year. Last year, the four towns, all four towns <coughs> agreed to do a, t a two year method, um, which is what Dr. Slaughter was mentioning earlier. And essentially, because all the town budgets, including these assessments, are approved by town meetings, and this isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing, there's a lot of democracy involved. And so you can have members of finance committees or select boards or whatever decide that they think an assessment methodology is reasonable, and then they bring it back to their town meeting, the town members hear about it, and they have a different opinion. Or they have many different opinions, and they argue about it themselves. And essentially, that's... Essentially, that's what's happened is that the two-year solution has, has broken down and there's a trying to find another effort to find an alternative. The interesting thing about this, which I think is really, really important, is that even though this is supposed to be only about apportioning costs to the town, like we know what our budget is, how much do you have to pay, the reality is it doesn't end up really working that way because if, if you have towns that, um, for any good reason, feel like they can't afford to pay what they're paying, then what you end up doing is you're getting into this relationship between what towns think they can pay and what the budget ends up being. And so just as an example, in the town of Leverett, they've had to cut out of their municipal budget quite a bit of money from the Leverett Elementary School as well as other, as well as other municipal functions. It's a source of really great concern and great angst and anxiety within that community. And so, and I'm not picking on Leverett, but I'm just saying it's a great example. So when Leverett comes to this conversation about the regional budget, they want to be as supportive as they possibly can, but they're doing it in the context in which their own town services that are not part of the region are similarly being cut. Is that a reasonable explanation? And so, and this is my last, okay. I mean, so we have such a large group of people that have questions here tonight. Um, my, so are you thinking, and this doesn't, I'm not trying to, you know, trip anybody up. So are you, con you're continuing to think about ha where to cut, where to, or are you like set? Or are you still thinking, because, you know, we have a proposal, right? So the, the, the restorative justice has a proposal, right? And our proposal is like, you know, almost the amount of your, you know, in red, so, you know, 300,000. And, um, you know, but the ideas behind it are still there. And so is, are you still thinking about, like, where, in fact, are you going to be able to bring in ideas and things like that within the budget that you have? So are you still thinking about, well, where can we cut or change, you know, or use something that already exists for, something else because it's not working or whatever. I mean, is that, are you? Absolutely. Am I, okay, am I being clear? Because I feel you're, like, you're uh, being, I know I am in my brain, but. <laughs> no, you are, you are being clear okay. and also that's the, honestly, that's the point of this, that's one of the points of this hearing. And also Dr. Morris mentioned that um, we're intending to do another hearing in a couple of weeks. Before and, you, before you make a decision, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. before okay. there's a vote. And, and so similarly, that's, that's part of the point is you want to hear from, people and then listen to them right okay so one of the things I didn't hear um, enough and even in the equity you know that I would would have liked to hear one of the things that I don't hear enough in terms of like how money is used is I don't hear enough about how money is used with the community and how even the issue around equity how it impacts the actual community and when I say community I'm talking about the families of the children 
and the commu- the people that live where the families of the children live. So we're talking about like the community. So that's one of the things that I really, you know, is kind of missing a lot. It's that connection. And that's why our proposal, a lot of the stuff in our proposal talks about, you know, incorporating and doing things that bring the community in. And there's a reciprocity with the community because I, you know, especially the community that doesn't show up for these or that can't show up. Um, the communities that, um, you know, aren't part of those, you know, those town meetings where, you know, people come back and they're like, what the hell were you doing over there? And we don't like that. And you're supposed to be representing us. There's such a large portion of the community that doesn't participate in that. And so how do we, you know, how do we engage and get that voice and those needs um, um, into, you know, into these spaces so that when you're making decisions, you know, you're informed not just by six cats from the equity task force, which I think we do a pretty good job because we're, we're kind of diverse and we also mix with a lot of people in the community. So we are bringing a lot, you know, but that's not enough, right? So I, I would like to see that, and uh, especially in the equity. And also I didn't hear anything around students. I know Ms. Cunningham said that, I don't know if that's her, but the impact that um, these cuts are having on students could have, I would like a little more clarity about that. Like if there is an impact on the student body, what is that impact? You know, and, 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 and what are you going to do? If that impact is important, what are you gonna do to soften the blow? Is there anything else you can do, right? So we don't have world languages. Oh, so, well, no, we don't have world languages. But we're making a cut in world languages, but is there anything you can do with the resources that are around here, UMass and Holy, Mount Holyoke, and, Smith and all that to buffer that so that it doesn't look like you're, you're taking away, but you're saying, we're taking away here because we don't have that money, but we're going over here because we think that there's some resources here that we can tap into to kind of minimize the impact. And that also goes with the math curriculum. So many things that I, you know, I have all these ideas that are going on in my head about things that can be done with the, with the universities that would be either low cost or no cost. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just think I'd really like to point the public towards the um, financial documents that are available online because it's really difficult during these hearings to go into the level of detail that I think anybody in the public should be um, who's interested. Should, and I'm not saying everybody in the public should be reading the financial section of the, the budget document, but but we do make that yeah. information available publicly. Can, and you, remind, can in, you remind? Can I just say something about that? That's really yeah. good. That's really good, and I appreciate that. But I, I always want to say that these things, these documents, yeah. and even these hearings and those things, that is not accessible always to. Like, I would say probably the majority of the population yeah. that you serve, this is like, talk about world languages, a completely <laughs> other language. It's, it's a world language in and of itself well, that you've just created. So mm. yeah. I just want to bring that to the. Right. Yeah. And ex- it, and I'm going to interject the fact that this is the reason I said earlier about ground rules is I didn't view what you were saying as debating no, and I wasn't. with Caridad around what yeah. she was asking for. No, and no, I'm no. just sort of clarifying, you're sort of adding an additional bit of information. I yeah, have. just because yeah. if you just turn in for the hearing, um, you won't, I mean, this is also available yeah. online and I would just really encourage people to, to access it as another right. resource, right. not as a right. debating yeah. point, yeah. I would like to just make one comment. This is my first year going through this budget I'm s- process. I'm sorry. Can I can I do one thing here? Are there any additional comments for this public hearing? Okay. Uh, uh, no, no. Public comments, not committee comments. Uh, mm-hmm. Public okay. comments. <laughs> I'm closing the public hearing. Ms. Stancer, I'm sorry. Uh, just a piece of information from this because I was surprised when I read it and and I'm going to say it for anybody who might be watching or listening in fiscal year 2001 50% of our we we were supported 50% by state aid and other grants other things and this year we are supported 36% by state aid and other factors so that's why the towns are getting squeezed so much and Two years ago, I'm from Pelham, two years ago in Pelham, we did not know about a charter school student until after the town meeting passed the budget. So we had to cut 
police officer position that had, person had just been hired. We had to cut that position down and our principal took a cut in salary in order for us to be able to meet the budget that was required for the car charter school tuition. So they're difficult decisions when you get down to these kinds of things. There's just isn't enough to go around. So, Ms. Switzer, I feel like I interrupted you earlier. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I just wanted to Okay, no, I just I just was double resource. checking because I realized yeah. that was a weird interlude there on my on my part, and I apologize. Mr. Demley. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to echo Ms. Stancer's comments and that, you know, it's it's a really good big picture point to be making, particularly when we're doing a public hearing and we're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, this is a brutal zero-sum game where we are cutting things that we don't want to cut and, and we're having really difficult conversations that have not led to success in the four towns. And I think when we are all advocating and fighting together for what we value and what we feel our students need, it's important to remember who, who the real enemy is here. And the enemy is not Amherst, Pelham, Leavitt, or Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. The enemy is, is the state. It's the responsibility of the state and the state's dereliction of duty to support public schools in the cities and towns of Massachusetts, specifically not reforming the minimum aid policy for rural communities mm -hmm. and for small towns that distinguish places like Pelham and Leverett and Shrewsbury from places like Wells Lane, Sharon, and the charter school funding that gouges our budget every year for millions of dollars mm -hmm. and we would not be having the conversation about can we add this much for electric buses or this much for restorative justice if the charter school funding was reformed, if the minimum aid funding was reformed. And so <laughs> that's all, you know, nice bluster at the end of the day. We still actually have to make these cuts and it sucks. Um, but I think it is important, uh, particularly when we're forward facing and, and uh, putting this in context for the public about what, what's really going on. At the last meeting, the restorative justice people came up with a budget proposal. What's going to become of that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, I don't know if I'm looking at Ms. McDonald. Do you want to? Um, I mean, I'm happy to answer, but I don't know if you wanted to respond. I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah. Maybe you can um, add to it. So, we're um, at, at, the, at the regional, at our committee meeting, we were talking about ways that we can address those goals and, and work on those within the current budget because so much of that work could flow into um, existing resources and existing staff positions. So um, what we've started talking about, we haven't fixed a date yet, was to pull together a group from um, SETF as well as administrators, um, the principals, the family center, um, RJ coordinators, climate coordinators from the different schools um, to go through that and look and, and sort of work, take, take the SETF um, proposal and figure out a way to make much of that happen within our existing resources. Is that? Yeah, and I think that mirrors the same way um, our principals and our directors come up with, you know, in our budget, come up with budget proposals that have significant ads and they're doing that, they're mirroring, that process that Ms. McDonald said is being mirrored in our conversations with our own administrative team, uh, and it really is the same kind of process that there's a whole lot of things that, you know, we would like to do, and sometimes our budget doesn't allow for the kind of financial piece, so how do we make active, positive steps forward within our existing budget? I think actively, in, I think, the, I mean, in my comments at the last meeting, which which I think echoed the notion that the, that the budget didn't look particularly favorable for making yeah. significant ads, was the idea that we've heard both at the secondary and at the elementary level, very significant interest and also adoption of techniques, processes, and philosophy around restorative justice. And the, the question I, I had had, um, which is echoed, I think, in what Ms. McDonald's saying and what you're saying, is that, I mean, we know that, to me, the reality is if everything is always, and I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying, if one only looks at the bottom line of a line item, then you're not really seeing whether there's commitment to move something forward. Because line items go up, line items go down, and in fact, you know, as we talked about a meeting or two ago, uh, Mr. Demling, um, if we had an unexpected recession, we would get walloped with additional cuts that we'd have to absorb, and those things happen. As was pointed out by Ms. Stancer, we've had cuts that happened back in the 2001 recession that have, that have essentially been never never been restored. 
let alone additional hits we got from the 2008 recession. So the question ends up being, what's the daily work that's going on for principals, directors, and staff people? How are we engaging with the public around seeing what are the creative ways we can continue to make progress on these goals, adopt new techniques? Maybe with the second professional development day, there's some workshops that can be put in there additionally. Um, and also the, the reality is sometimes funding doesn't, even funding plans don't always work out in year the way you think they're going to. And so if, you know, if you take this as a static moment, it can seem negative. If we engage together on this, then you may find that in September or October, there's some, uh, some federal grant money or something uh, that, you, that you didn't realize could be available and fungible that would allow some resources to go in ways that are supportive and helpful, right? Mm -hmm. So you keep at it and you keep at the dialogue. And I think that actually is a way of maintaining a real commitment and one that can be tested. Um, I guess we're looking to move on since I've just gotten an item that suggests we're moving on. Um, so maybe we are. Um, thank you very much. Thanks. But actually, the next item on the agenda is second quarter budget update. Mm -hmm. Not what was the past around. So, um, although in the black and white copy you can't see the little colored circles, they're all green except for one, <laughs> <laughs> which is yellow. Um, so what we've done here on, on the second quarter update is, is taken our, our, uh, our budget, uh, applied those known expenditures we've done to date, uh, and, in, and in most categories I was realizing as I was looking at this a little bit more and, and putting this together that uh, you know, some of the uh, projected uh, encumbrances for, uh, in particular, uh, health benefits, which is at a risk and benefits, is probably a bit low which is also why it's highlighted in, in yellow, because well, it looks like we have 1.9 million available to spend through the rest of the year. Um, we know that we have a number of, of uh, obligations to, to fund our health insurance for folks, and so that's gonna, gonna chew that up. So the, the long story short on that, the reason why that one is yellow in particular is because we are uh, right at sort of uh, what we budgeted versus what we what we expect to spend in the course of the year. And so it's just going to need close monitoring as we go through the rest of the year uh, that in the other categories within, I mean, the other expenditures within that category, we're keeping a close eye. Um, but that area may need ultimately some support from some other areas that might have a more positive, uh, more positive outcome over the course of the, of the remainder of the fiscal year. And we get to end of uh, fiscal quarter three, which will be the end of March. Um, we'll have a much clearer picture about where we sit. Um, we are in the fortunate circumstance, and I, I, I go into this a little bit in the, at the top of the second page about uh, our special education costs have come in under what we expected, not to the extent we thought when, when Mr. Mangano uh, talked to us at the end of quarter one. Um, you know, there have been some changing demographics within our school, and that's uh, reduced that, but we're still in a, in, a, in a positive place relative to our overall budget, so that'll help us out and will probably help us to support uh, fiscal year 21 in some ways. Um, and so in, in general, I think the, the short story is things are all right. We've got to keep a close eye on, on, our, uh, on our risk and benefits and, and how those play out over the course of the rest of the year um, and, and you know, keep a close eye on, on uh, you know, our other expenditures generally. I mean, for example, payrolls on target, but there's not a lot of wiggle room there either. So, uh, you know, if, if uh, someone moves into the district and it changes our need around staffing, that's going to make that one a, a tough area as well. And so, uh, you know, it's an ongoing, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say battle, but it's an ongoing uh, evaluation of where we sit in our budget relative to what our, our circumstances are. And so we, we keep a close eye on those things. Uh, again, things are generally in good shape, <coughs> but a couple of things to keep an eye on. So I think that I'm open to any questions you might have relative to this. Committee? Realizing we're actually not quite halfway through our agenda, so I'm going to keep it rolling. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next item is the school choice hearing. So uh, I think I'm just going to read aloud. They review the superintendent's recommendation for that accept school choice students for FY21. Often receive feedback on this recommendation. 
So uh, the thing I want to note, and there's a memo in the packet for me on this topic, that this is a, a bit of a different recommendation that I've made in, in previous years and have been made before me. And I'm just going to read it out loud since not everyone has, in, maybe watching, has the packet in front and because it is a change. Based on enrollment, estimated enrollments in grades 7 through 12, the administration is recommending that the school committee vote not to participate in the school choice program in the 2020-2021 school year. Acceptance of choice, school choice students in the regional district has historically been based strictly on availability of seats while retaining preferred class sizes. We do not anticipate having such seats, such seats available in the coming year. We estimate that there will be a total of 120 choice, choice, school choice students <coughs> excuse me, in the regional district next year compared to 102 this year. This is based on having six graduating seniors and an estimated 24 incoming seventh graders who are school choice students from our mem four member communities. It's important to note that the current sixth grade students enrolled in Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, or Shutesbury Elementary Schools through school choice will still automatically matriculate in the seventh grade at arms, even if the district does not participate in the school choice program the coming year. And I'll, I'll go more nutshell on this one, which is uh, when we open up school choice and don't open up seats, it's really frustrating and not fair to families who apply and call back and say, are you going to open up seats? And we've had the experience last year. We didn't open up many seats. And uh, we only, only opened up at 7th and ninth grade, I believe. And, you know, we did a lottery for all the grade levels. And for families to be waiting uh, didn't feel great to us. It felt like we weren't being, we tried to be as candid as we could be. And in this particular year, we're talking to the principals of both the middle school and the high school. Given the inc size of the incoming 6th grade class, we're not looking like, it does not appear that there are choice seats available. In other words, we're looking like, in, term in terms of maintaining class size, we're at capacity, and our choice numbers will go up, which is healthy for our school choice balance. So it's a different recommendation for you all. I'm very open if you want to, um, you know, if the committee feels differently, that's fine. But uh, at this point, I'm, none of uh, the administration is looking that we'll open up seats, and I don't want to have a false dynamic where we say we're a school choice district and then um, don't open up slots. So can I, can I just ask a couple of clarifying questions? Please. And, and I think they're helpful just because of the use of language. Yeah. Because um, we've talked about this before yeah. offline, that that you that if we're if we're in a position where we don't think we're going to be able to accept any new school choice students this coming year at the secondary district, and therefore we don't participate in this year's program, uh, for the, which would open up seats for new students in the school choice program. Program. The, the way that's described publicly is that we're not participating in the school choice program, right? That is correct. Okay. So, but there's no f functional impact uh, in any way on any students and families that are currently enrolled in school choice in our district. Not in, that's correct, yes. Okay. And a decision to not participate in school choice this year does not, this is kind of double, I don't want to double or triple negative. <laughs> if we don't participate in school choice this year, we could still choose this coming year. We could still choose to participate in the following year. It doesn't make any permanent decisions around this. It's, it's a yearly vote that's required of school committees, yes. Okay. Is there anything else of a similar sort of FAQ section question that the public might, that you might have? <laughs> Can I try even more short and <laughs> concise? So not participating in school choice for 2021 means we're not accepting any new choice students beyond those that are already in the district or rising into seventh grade from sixth grade in member towns. Correct. Okay. That was an awesome job. Thank you. That was exactly, <laughs> I was just, I was, I was envisioning parents out there and folks out there sitting like, wait a minute, what are they, do? what are they talking about doing? <laughs> and what about my kid or what about my grandkid or whatever? Serena. As long as it's a one-year vote, I favor it because the town of Pelham School depends depends on school choice revenue. I don't. This is a hearing, right? It is. So we're not actually going to be. Where the committee itself is not going to be debating the subject, although they can ask questions or make a comment now, right? That's correct. At the next meeting, it would be on the agenda for the committee to debate and make a decision. Okay. Uh, and uh, are there any other clarifying questions from the committee members that would be helpful or whatever? Yes, Mr. Dunley. About how much revenue do we project to, do we currently get and do we project to get from school choice? 
Uh, uh, for the students that are currently in. Ask the hard question. Um, I look back at the section here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're going to use. We're going to. The revenue is greater than than what we're going to use, uh, so we'll be building our school choice balance. That's the short answer. Uh, that doesn't get to the specifics. It's, it's it's over half a million. Oh yeah. Okay. I just I, for for public understanding of what does school choice do for us, it gives us a half a million dollars. Well, at least for the next year's projected budget under the budget. That's correct. Yeah. And and actually, I guess Dr. Morris. Um, what work do you do to try to make sure that there isn't a net additional cost for an added student? So it's exactly the work that's resulted in here as we look at the class size, what, what we want our projected class size to look like, and if we took school choice students, would they actually have a choice of electives, right? So some of the core classes are easier to predict because most students enter our typical core sequence. Uh, but what we were finding last year and why we took so few is that there weren't empty seats in most of the elective courses. So I didn't feel like we were um, doing that. But I think to the broader question, now that I think about it, I'm sorry, uh, your specific question, um, we don't add sections or we add courses based on that. So we're only filling empty seats in our schools. Mm -hmm. We're not looking to say, oh, if we take four more choice students, we can have one more section of this math course or something like that. It's looking really, are there going to be vacant seats in classes? How many and how do we fill them? Point of clarification. You said next year's school choice students will be larger than this year's school choice students. The number of students will be greater next year than this year. And that's due to rising students. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the delta between rising sixth grade students and graduating 12th grade students. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to open up the school. Yes? I just want to, I'm recalling the spreadsheet that has the. It's, for the coming year with the 120 projected, it's close to $700,000 of income. And that, that is, there's a base amount for each student. And then uh, if they have special education needs, that also is added into it. Um, that tends to be a bit of a, a zero-sum game, as they right. say, relative right. to that concern. But but the total number of, of incoming dollars, about 700000 with this size of student population. Okay. And so the committee will take this up at the next meeting. And I want to open up the hearing and also say this time, because last time we just sort of opened it up more broadly. Um, if, if, uh, if, if comments or questions could be limited to around three to five minutes, it would be great. Okay, so what, what are some of the reasons people want, want choice? What are some of the reasons people want to, you know, choose to go to another, you know, have their child go to another school? It's just, I... Anybody. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Morris? Yeah, so when we asked that question a few years ago, because we surveyed choice families, um, the three things that came up were diversity of the students, um, the elective course offerings, and a wide range of um, extracurricular activities. Those are the three things that I remember. I'm citing two years ago off the top of my head, so I could be missing something, um, but those were three things that came up consistently, um, as I recall. Um, some, Mr. Sullivan was here then. Does that sound about right? That's, yeah, that Sounds about right. Okay, so when we said revenue, what somebody um, translate that word language for me? Like, you make money off of so school when, choice. So yeah. when when school choice students come to your district, um, and school choice children. Before we even go, this just some more clarification. So school choice children can come also from another district. Is that correct? Why don't you grab sure. This so stuff. school choice is a state program where students who don't live in member towns or communities attend school in those member towns and communities. Okay, so it's not an internal school choice. You know how some people want to go to? Right. This is different from the internal school choice. We're talking about other districts outside of the Amherst Regional. Exactly. And you're asking, you're saying we shouldn't do that this year. Okay, so yeah. now, my question. No, please, you, keep, you oh. can just keep going. Sure. No, Dr. Morris, keep going. So the way the state calculate, do you want to talk about the... Revenue, now I think. Know, now I actually think I understand a little bit. For the benefit but of the public it's watching, kind of a I think it's important. Answer, though, so, yeah. you know. Sure. So uh, the state system is that for every student who comes from another community, um, five thousand dollars comes from comes with that student. And as Mr. Slaughter said, there's if the student has special needs, there's an increment uh, that's attached to that. And the state gives you that. Well, no, does it come from the district? Comes from the other district. It yeah. comes from the other district. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Okay. The state does all the billing. But yeah. Okay. It's from that, that community. 
Okay, so, um, all right, so missing out on some money if you don't do it, but then you might be messing with some other districts if you do. I mean, the way I see it, just black and white like that, you might be affecting another poorer district that may not have the same wealth or whatever it is that people, oh, this wording, okay. Um, so the three things, the reason I asked the, the three things is because I wanna go back to what I said before. So if you know that something has, well, in this case it wouldn't be that because then the other, so, yeah, so I, I, I guess I'm a little, I guess I'll go back to why, um, and, and I'll try to make it brief. So in the restorative justice proposal, we talked about kind of being a leader, that the, the, that the district has the, uh, actually you are taking leadership. There, there aren't a lot of schools that are doing restorative justice. And not many of them have immediately moved into like another grade, which you did, which is great. You know, you went to the middle school and that was great. And um, so I just, I, I worry that, that Amherst, that this district, you know, the issue of diversity is so big. I know that that's why people come here. Even though I would question what that really means because you just, you know, getting in a room because there's like a lot of people of color or something doesn't actually make the room essentially diverse or just for that matter. But so like how does that play into the mission, right? So this school has a mission around social justice and multiculturalism <laughs> and other people from other districts who just don't have that because of the way those schools are structured and those communities are structured want to come here because we can offer that. So I just want to put that out there that, that you know, when you say no, then you're kind of saying, hmm, you know, you're, you're, you're not addressing that issue. Um, so I just wanted to put that out. Thank you. Or you're taking away from that when you don't participate. Any further comments of the, of the school choice hearing? With that, I will close the school choice hearing. Uh, and as, as I said to the committee members earlier, I reminded you, you will in fact have a bite at the apple to talk about this next meeting. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sullivan, do you have your hand up? No. Oh, okay, you were scratching or yes. pointing or something. Um, okay. Um, warrant review. I don't have any. Okay. Uh, item G, we are gonna table and talk about at the next meeting. Uh, Gridem H, Grade Span Advisory Board. Yep. So um, given the hour, uh, see if I can make up a little bit of time without shortchanging the topic. Um, so where the Grade Span Advisory is, we thought we had our last meeting. Um, it's famous last words in our community, I think. We think we have our last meeting, and, and sometimes we find out we didn't. Um, and the good news part of that is that last Friday, there was a group of, there was one um, parent guardian and a number of staff members from the middle school and also from the sixth grades um, who went and visited JFK Middle School, which is the middle school in Northampton that covers grades six through eight in that community. And I want to publicly thank um, their principal, Leslie Wilson, as well as their staff. They went out of their way to um, give us time in classrooms as well as conversations with um, parents, guardians who are on their parent council, the counseling team, because one of the things that keeps coming up is uh, how to students in grade six social emotionally, what's the best setting for them. And so we had, a, we had an opportunity to meet with their counselor and um, their administrative team as well as some of their sixth and seventh grade teachers. Uh, we got in about eight classrooms as well to be able to observe what middle school look like in a grade six or eight school. Northampton was a particularly good proxy uh, for us because it has relatively similar demographics um, and also from a school size perspective, their school's a little over 600 students. Um, if this change was to occur, our middle school would be a little under 600, but in the overall scheme of things, pretty <coughs> darn similar. And so it was a really helpful day and one of the community members who went suggested that we pull one more meeting of the grade span advisory back just to share what we learned because it was, you know, we did all this kind of theoretical work and reading and trying to put things together and then you actually go to a middle school that's six through eight and you learn things that you can't learn from, you know, even really good dialogue and really excellent literature and research. So we are going to meet one more time in early March. Uh, but where we are is that we have received reports. Um, I'm starting to work on an executive summary and a summary presentation. 
Uh, we have a report uh, preface document and a comparison factors document. And I think it's worth noting uh, the group worked on um, a document that when it says comparison factors, you know, we're looking at areas of consideration, potential attributes, possibilities, and priorities, and certain considerations and challenges that looked at a variety of different areas. I'm going to mention them quickly because I think it, it actually brings it to light a little more. And what would be the impact if sixth graders were educated in a sixth grade, a K to six school versus a six through eight school? So the areas that the, and this was a large group exercise, um, was academic and curricular programming, special education, elective options, staffing, social emotional well being, family engagement. Governance, by governance, they're talking about middle school administration, uh, infrastructure and facilities, district viability, and the finances, transportation, food service, and transition planning. So it's a pretty comprehensive, thorough document that the group put together. Additionally, uh, an, a, a subgroup on the academics put together a report. I think it's like 24 pages, and it has um, a variety of different information about you know, what potential academic models. Um, schedules and feedback from middle school teachers as well as elementary or sixth grade teachers. And finally, there was a, a feedback and outreach subcommittee report which had recommendations that were more process based moving forward. I had to solicit more feedback from our community and different stakeholders, as well as a frequently asked questions document which they asked me to edit because there's some things that just administratively I have, tend to have more information on certain things. Uh, so they put that together um, and it needs my attention, which I have yet to get to. And uh, there'll be a lot of appendices as well of all the presentations and, and information and other documents related to this, um, this project. So it does push our timeline back a little bit um, to think about having one more meeting. And I agree with the community member, it's time well spent. And there's work happening on putting this final presentation together uh, in the interim. It's not slowing things down, but I think having that group come together once more, both to review, so the executive summary, summary presentation, but also be able to hear about the direct experience of a group of, I think, nine or ten people who went to JFK would be incredibly valuable. Um, so that's sort of where we are. I think uh, longer term, you know, we hope to get that out. We will get that out um, in March or April. Uh, and that really engaged one of the uh, primary recommendations of the outreach subcommittee, which Ms. McDonald was a part of, was uh, to have some initial surveying so that there's a group in the summer who can take that feedback from the grade span advisory, feedback from the larger community, and put together more of an actual on-the-ground proposal uh, that can be brought to all four communities as well as to all five school committees, I suppose, uh, in the fall that's a little more tangible, um, but really to get one round of feedback now um, and to, imp to use that to put together a more tangible, practical proposal. So I tried to capture a lot in a short amount of time, given the time, but Ms. McDonald, am I missing anything? No. Nope. Okay. No, from my perspective. <laughs> okay. So, a um, couple things. Is there a quorum of Bellamere? There is not. No. Okay. Aren't you lucky? Uh, there's definitely a quorum of Amherst, uh, the Amherst Elementary Committee. So I'm just reminding people to just do me, a, do me and us a favor and don't talk about the relative benefits or impacts on elementary schools. Just don't. We'll take it up at a different meeting where you, that is legally and properly posted. Uh, 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 so let's step back for a second. In the big picture, last year you presented sort of a timeline of how you thought you were proposing to approach this and how it interacted with the different committees, uh, this committee, and with uh, the member towns. Could you remind, you can either remind people of what that timeline was or tell me what that timeline is. Sure. I mean, with, with the caveat that by saying it, you're not saying you're recommending moving sixth grade to the middle school right. at all. Right. It's simply there's got to be some general process calendar of how you would engage if at different gating points you move forward, we move forward. Yeah, I think um, so. The, the originally we talked about having a report in February, and I think that was a good. Um, aspirational goal. It's not quite where we are, um, but I think for good reason because the engaging the community is worthwhile and rushing that to get to even a process outcome doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. Uh, we've an additional experience that we're um, looking forward to, as I said, you know, getting the group back together again, we'll have some additional information at that point, and moving forward looking to get a first round of surveying done this spring for the larger community, um, which is again not the do you support this change or not because we're not recommending a change. 
We don't even have a specific model to recommend change. But what are people's thoughts? What do people see as potential advantages? What do people see as uh, things that need to be resolved? And that's a really critical component to gaps for that. We've got a pretty nice set of uh, cross-section of stakeholders on the Great Span Advisory, but bringing that out. It'll also uh, bring much more information to the larger community. One of the benefits of having a survey that goes out to a lot of people is they're like, wow, this is being studied, even though we've talked about it here and other ways when people are asked directly, it highlights that this is something that's <laughs> under consideration. Uh, have a group in the summer to um, take a look at that feedback, the Great Span Advisory, come up with something much more tangible, come back in the fall with something tangible for your consideration, with your approval, because it's going to have to come here first, in my opinion, because it's if, if you all say, like, no, we don't want sixth graders in the middle school, it's, a, it's kind of a moot point. Um, but then really doing much more outreach, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't say that. I just want to be really clear process-wise that you all have this, <coughs> this committee, because you, you mentioned other committees, this committee has a large role in kind of the, right. the, the fall. Uh, to see how they think about it, what are the potential implications, do additional rounds of surveying and feedback, and really coming to a decision uh, sometime in about a year from now, next so January. Who's doing that? Uh, this would be, at least at first, the regional school committee. Um, so what are we doing in the fall then? In the fall, it would be you know, really around engagement uh, around um, with the larger community about whether this thing is the worth pursuing or not. And uh, I... Let me take a step back because I think your question prompted I'm also me. wanting you, if yeah. you'll forgive me. Yeah. You're, I mean, I was trying to get you to give a concise timeline so that people could follow it. And I'm failing And you. you're getting into the weeds <laughs> again. Yeah. And people are going to continue to lose the, yeah. like, if you know what I mean, like, yeah. there's sort of the topic bullet of what we're doing. Yeah. And then underneath that, I think the public, I mean, for, I'm not, by the way, I don't mean this in a bad way. No, I'm. To, for I'm, anybody watching at home, they should be impressed by the fact that for the committee, and for you, you're yeah. doing a lot of work. Yeah. There's a lot of thought. There are a lot of process points and steps, a lot of check-ins. Yeah. And I think people should feel good and confident that you're going to be doing that. Right. So I'm just asking, like, what? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Please. I, I pulled up a... Okay. Would you like... <laughs> sure. I'd love for someone else to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, what I have here, and I'm happy to... We can we can send it to the committee after, after um, this evening and even append it to the minutes, potentially. But... Um, so it's, it's a rough timeline um, that sort of has, has bullet points, um, pretty succinct, not a lot of detail. Um, and so we had the report in February, moving that a little bit to the spring. But in the bucket of the spring, that's, uh, the focus is really on having, um, getting initial feedback, um, initial concerns, desires, and considerations, reaction based on the, the report that is going to be shared um, at the Region School Committee. Um, so that and the FAQ will be posted on the Middle School Grade Span Advisory Board website um, and then shared to collect feedback from both community and staff. Um, that then over the summer, and we, we sort of likened it to the process that we had with the dual language um, at a in the Amherst School Committee, which in that one there was a discussion about whether we wanted to explore um, the dual language in, in the Amherst Elementary School. So the discussion would happen here about whether this was something that we wanted to explore, and then over the summer that group would work together. There would be an, a, gr a new group, as um, primarily of staff, that would put together a more concrete plan um, for how it could work um, in the Amherst Middle School. From there, um, in the fall, we would be collecting additional feedback and input from community and staff on that detailed plan. So again, very similar to the process that we had with the, um, with the dual language program in Amherst. Um, and then decisions would be made by the individual school committees in 2021, um, January, February timeframe in 2021 for a potential you know, if it were approved by anybody, it, the region first, and then any of the individual elementary school committees would happen in the fall of 2022. Mr. Mayor? You said in the fall you'd collect information. Does that mean that there'd be actual meetings of Pelham parents assembled in the fall for them to express their opinion? Yes. Stands there. Could you clarify again? So the school committees would vote. It's down the road. You said when would that be? So 
first the we our committee right. would vote whether we wanted to um, have sixth grade or right. enable sixth grade to right. um, be in the middle school. Then the individual elementary committees would need to take it up and, and have those deliberations and discussions and make decisions. And I don't know that there's a fixed timeline on that. I think fall. So I guess my question then is, so for example in Pelham, would that then also have to go to town meeting or is that strictly a school committee decision? So there's two ways uh, that if this was pursued and desirable that it could happen. One is a rental agreement, which would not need to go to town meetings because it wouldn't affect the regional agreement. The other is to fully, and particularly in a scenario to be very blunt about it, where all four towns sent their sixth graders, uh, my personal opinion is then you really, a rental agreement for space doesn't make a whole lot of sense mm -hmm. if all the towns are sending their students. And then if it was an adjustment to the regional agreement, it would have to go to town meetings and town council in Amherst. Okay. Mr. Punch, and then Mr. Cummings. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I should feel this way, but I, I, given the schedule that you outlined, I sort of feel as if the bus has already left the station. If this committee is going to be making the first decision regarding this issue, then the smaller communities are left with a fait accompli. And um, mm -hmm. explain to me why you're shaking your head. Okay. Can it, do you have any, I guess I, I have I have a question. Do you have an answer to that question and then Mr. Dumbling has the floor anyway? <laughs> yeah, so um, no decision's been made. Really what Ms. McDonald, if I, if I can, because it's a document we mm -hmm. both worked on, is really the region has to open the door for the small towns, for all four towns, not the small towns, all towns, to engage in the dialogue and debate because if the regional school committee says, we don't want sixth graders in our middle school, it doesn't really matter what the elementary districts say because the region owns the middle school and the region as an entity owns it. No decision's been made and I'll be very blunt with you, there's a lot of diversity of opinion uh, right now in the larger community as well as on the grade span advisory around that topic. So the reason the region has a, a more significant initial role is because they, they are the owner of the building that if this was to occur, sixth graders would be educated in. I understand that, but that doesn't mean that the um decision might not be made initially by this group, which puts the pressure on the elementary schools to make a decision that they might not originally have wanted to make. So Mr. Demley actually has the floor next. Oh, <laughs> so, um, I mean, I'll just make maybe another attempt to explain what Mr. Dr. Morris said. I, I, I think, I like the analogy, it's, you know, if, if the sixth grade is gonna come to the middle school, uh, this committee oversees the middle school building, right? The, the physical building that is the Amherst Regional Middle School, the building down the, down the road. So if it's, it's our job to open the door. It's, it's, it's making the invitation, right? It, it unlocks the door. It's completely up to the Am individual elementary school committees of Amherst, Pell, and Levin, Shutesbury to decide independently if they would like to, uh, at that point, so let's, let's say in a, in a scenario in which this committee says, yes, we'll allow sixth grade in middle school. It's up to those four communities then to, to make their own decisions about whether to come or not. Like, you know, like in, in, independently. Um, the thing I want to say, though, um, so I don't know if I helped to clarify oh, that. Oh, okay. But the, but the comment I want to make before is on the schedule. Um, it does seem kind of long. Um, I know it's a huge change, um, but it, it, it feels kind of long to me. The only maybe tweak I would suggest is to shoot for this committee making a decision by December of this year as opposed to starting school committee starting to make decisions in January, so it's only a month, um, but since this is the first domino that has to fall, and if we say no, well, then that's it, <laughs> I think it would be a natural sort of conclusion point. And we've already had mm -hmm. experiences where if we want to give something its proper due, we'll allow dates to, to slip. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think that would be a little more pragmatic. Thank you. I would like, no, to, ask no, my, ahead, I would like to ask my question. So I thought I understood Ms. Ms. McDonald to say we would vote on op on considering it. It didn't say we would vote on doing it. It was a vote on opening up the exploration. That is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I thought you said you. I I I thought though that I thought there was a vote like at the end of this academic year. To, to on the exploration question 
and then there's a second vote yeah. that could be in January, or as Mr. Demling said, maybe December, that would that would be a more formal vote yeah. mm -hmm. of we are officially saying we would enter into agreements mm -hmm. that allow sixth grade kids to come here. Correct. There's there would be two, two. votes of this okay. committee, All one right. to explore it and and work on devising and develop it potential plan mm -hmm. and be, begin um, I'm just reading again in the su for so for summer of 2020 pending the, a positive vote from this committee to explore it that plan would a staff working group would be convened to develop a concrete proposal to bring back to the community staff would also engage elected officials in the member towns on ways to implement the change so that's where the discussion about rental agreement or change to regional agreement and then um, this district would consider what capital needs we would um, need to make to uh, were we to make that shift and then in the fall is when deliberations happen and a decision here whether we're opening the door for sixth graders um, would happen okay so I wanna, thank you I'm gonna call on myself sorry for <laughs> um, the uh, the re one of the I was I was really excited to get this on the agenda um, and one of the reasons I was excited to get that on the agenda is, you know, there's, I don't know, I'm trying to think of what metaphor or analogy to use, and so I'm not going to bother one. This is an enormously complicated process with many moving pieces, um, different communities that are going to have significant interest in the topic, and there are so many ways... I don't even know what going wrong means in this context <laughs> because the entire point is you'd have to have a position that you believed in in order to say it was had gone wrong and I don't even know that we have a I mean I don't mean I mean I don't mean as a group we clearly don't know it as a group but I mean even as individuals I'm not even sure we have anything in front of us that would allow us to say we have an opinion to know whether it worked or not so what I do know we could say is that some processes work better than others and that it is definitely possible to say that this process could work well or work poorly, irrespective of the outcome we come to. Mm -hmm. And so I think you've, you've obviously you've done a ton of work uh, up into this point. And what I would beg, I guess I'll say talk to you, Dr. Yeah, Morris. I'll so beg much. you to do um, is you got to you got to come up with a much more defined process yeah. and a much more defined timeline and much more defined language about how you're engaging different communities of interest and stakeholders and official bodies right. so that people can understand this process, what's going on. It's actually, by the way, why I wanted to do the agenda is I, I knew that once we entertain this topic, either this wonderful flow of words would come out and all, everything would seem simple and easy. And exp you know, even if we all disagreed with each other, we'd be like, wow, I totally understand what's happening. This is amazing. Or the opposite would happen, and it would be like, well, I kind of understand what's going on, but it seems like it's raised even more questions than I need answers, right? right? right. And that's obviously the latter that's happened. Right. Um, so I just, I don't know how, I, don't, I mean, whether we need some, I don't know how you do it or what assistance we need to do it, right. but I, I, I beg us to do that, because I think otherwise we're not going to have the conversation mm -hmm. we think we want to have. I think Mr. Menino had his hand up, and then Ms. Pitzer. Somewhere along the line in the future, I wish you to be specific about what votes would be, what arrangement would have to take place for there to be a town meeting vote in Pelham on the issue. You said there were a rental agreement and whatever. Not now, sometime. What arrangement would prompt a town meeting vote? Because it's nothing else. The regional assessment's going to go up. Ms. Pitzer. So my initial reaction when listening was um, when you used the term surveying, I, um, my mind went back to that survey ages ago about looking at moving folks to the high school. I think there was right. a survey yeah, yeah. back. Right. And, and, and I wasn't on the committee. I was a community member with a kid in preschool, I think. So um, I was glad I got it and had an opportunity. But I also feel like um, I didn't have the context. Mm -hmm. And I'm really concerned um, that, as all of us clearly here are missing some context, that surveying the public about their opinions on this without more information about um, the process could potentially really backfire. Right. Um, and we'd have um, people's opinions about things and um, how you design that survey 
who you survey, how you get it out is really important. So um, I, uh, red flags are going up for me a little bit and, and kind of had the opposite reaction to Peter actually, which is making a decision on this when I'm in January without kind of laying that groundwork of getting word out to this committee, let alone the larger community. Um, it's going to be hard work, and I think we need to um, be careful as we move forward. And I, um, I've worked on surveys a bit in the past, and so I'd be, I, I, I don't know if the entire committee needs to see it, but like I personally would love to take a look at it mm -hmm. as a survey researcher. Um, Okay, Mr. Do you have a response? Just very briefly. Sure. So thank you. And, and the subgroup that worked on it kind of indicated that they didn't draft a survey because they don't have the, the background or expertise. They had some links to other surveys that were used. And I think um, I think it's important to note that when we think about surveys, we want to, the intention of having one in the spring is having it in conjunction with executive summary and report so that it's providing, not that everyone reads everything that you send them, but you're giving, it's not just a random survey with no context, but actually the reason we're holding off on soliciting feedback in that way is we want to actually have the report done and have a summary that people can read and, and respond to with it, and that it's not like, do you think this is a good idea or not? It's really trying to get qualitative data about people's interests, concerns, questions, um, as opposed to like yay, nay, because we're not there. So I. I I thought it was relevant to the question, Ed. I'm not sure, trying to extend that. Can I just have a follow-up? Because as a, sorry, sorry. I'm a mixed methodology <laughs> PhD in yeah. research, so I, I'm just sorry. I'm gonna, no, but no, I, no. I, I, I'm curious about like maybe focus groups or right. maybe not doing a survey. Like m the listening sessions were kind of nice in that I think they allowed everybody to go out and um, listen. So I'm just curious if that's been considered and maybe in conjunction or I'm just. And I apologize because there wasn't any material in the. Yes. So, okay. so having been on that outreach yeah. group, that uh, like, that's exactly sort of what is it being entertained. Is that very similar to the approach that the Amher School Committee make, took in terms of the listing session su supplemented with an online survey? Good. That's um, you know it, whether it would be as formal as the listing sessions that we did with the that Amher School Committee did on on that building project or more sort of forums, like a couple forums, um, TBD, but yes, it was. Good. It would be built off of sort of what we learned in the Amher School Committee process. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, then Mr. Fosh. Yeah, it's, um, it hasn't come up as an official item at the Shrewsbury School Committee, but unofficially, I can assure Mr. Fonch, the le representative from Leverett, that you can hide behind Shrewsbury because Shrewsbury will not be sending their sixth graders down the, down the hill, although I would be the first to vote to open those doors wide open to anyone that would want to send their sixth graders to the middle school. Mr. Potts. Yeah, um, I guess I should thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Um, but be that as it may, um, I, I would wonder if the advisory group has had lengthy conversations about the impact on assessment. Um, if Amherst is the only community that goes for this and costs go up, what happens to the assessment of the other three towns? Another hypothetical, if one of the smaller towns decides to go, same question, what happens to the assessment of the other two towns that decide not to go? I'm just wondering if you've had that conversation within the group. Uh, no is the short answer, but... <laughs> Yeah, I think that really gets at some of the work in the summer, not just on creating um, an educational vision and profile, but also on looking at the two options, whether it's changing the regional agreement or if it's a rental agreement, uh, to your point, um, that's different than affecting the regional ass assessments, uh, but that rental agreement would have to have some funds coming from the Amherst schools going to the region and how that gets distributed. Um, so just there's a lot of different variables to go to play at play, and that's why we really need time without school in session to be able to work through all those. Um, and you said that, would, that conversation would be in the summer? Is there thought of having um, additional members, say, of this committee be um, involved in that conversation, or at least in the audience? Uh, the Great Span Advisory would is, uh, what's the sunsetting? Is that the right term? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so this would be kind of more of a staff group, but I think if there are if the school committee, I know this is a topic that we didn't talk about tonight, but 
if there wanted to, if there was a desire for school committee members, because this is really a governance issue, it's not a staff issue uh, per se, who wanted to form a subcommittee, do some work with me and others in the summer on the governance side of it, I'd be happy to have that group to think about this with. I think I think that's part of. Um, I would strong. I would we. I would strongly urge the collective you <laughs> to map out where this is going, and not we're going like we know what the answer is and we're predicting the answer. It's telegraphed, but what's the, what's the process and decision map for this, and um, <coughs> thinking about the the public facing documents, inputs, information, uh, and engagement. Because I think it's. I just I. You know, it's. I think this has been a healthy conversation right. because it points out that we definitely don't have that now, <laughs> and and if we don't get it, then then I mean it's it's like, like a great example of the discussion of surveys and methodologies and the the ways the methods of reaching and engaging the public. What information do they have? You can you can see how an example of a major process point that's really a critical point for engagement and, and inputs and stuff can suddenly blow up if a number of other different either deliverables or communication, just an example of that. I would, I, the whole vision of should school committee members be engaged in some summer working group, that really opens up the can of worms of who are the decision makers <coughs> and stakeholders from the different towns at different levels that would be involved in this decision. How should any one of those stakeholders be engaged on a on a periodic and regular basis, or engage, or for an individual, possibly engage deeply in the process, so that you're sort of building that circuit mm -hmm. of communication and feedback, rather than having periodic moments where people then have sort of this all or nothing thing they've got to engage in. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying what the answer, well, I'm implying what part of the answer is, <laughs> in the same way that Ms. Spitzer clearly was. But I'm just saying you, we got to see that map. It's got to be much, much more detailed than it is mm -hmm. now. And, and, and then I think, I think what I appreciated about what was said earlier was there's also resources here too. So rather than simply saying, let's throw work on you, or throw work on you and Ms. McDonald, <laughs> there's, it is also a question of how do we resource this in a way that we can all contribute to its success. All right. We st well, believe it or not, we're still not actually done with our agenda. We have more. Exciting. Uh, superintendent evaluation update goal review, which is then also uh, connected to our timeline for doing the evaluation. So, um, as the I'm, I'm punting it over this way. Yes, so as the chair of the superintendent's evaluation subcommittee, um, I just want to kickstart a conversation as, um, just to remind the public, one of our primary um, responsibilities as school committee members is to annually evaluate the superintendent. And um, there's very... Um, clear guidelines from DESI on how we do that. Um, we've kind of developed this process where um, at the end of the year we go through and um, Debbie Westmoreland's been great in creating an electronic um, evaluation tool that we use. Um, typically the superintendent has created um, what we call the artifacts document, which is really, I, I find, incredibly useful and um, it presents kind of evidence and documentation of progress made with regard to each of the goals. So in the packet, sorry, it's two pieces. Um, so in the packet, we have the, the goals that we voted on um, and were approved. So that's this page here, the approved regional goals. And then the piece that I think um, looking for a little bit of feedback on, but also just um, because our superintendent also works for the Pelham and the Amherst Elementary School Districts and is evaluated by those districts as well. I want to say that I've I've shared these with both um, elementary committees, but I haven't yet heard back on whether or not this kind of timeline works generally with theirs, but we should be coordinating um, for everybody's benefit. So um, in the past, this has often gotten done, I think, a little bit later than what would be the preference for everyone, um, just because it's nice to kind of end the year 
I think, with an opportunity to discuss what the potential goals would be for next year, not necessarily to, to have them set in stone, but to at least give the superintendent an idea of, like, these are the things we'd like you to be working on next year. So I kind of worked backwards with um, um, Mr. Sullivan on, on the date where our last meeting would be, and then, or sorry, it was actually... Mr. Funch. Um, but anyways, we, we worked backwards and this was a proposal. So I mm -hmm. love feedback with the caveat that we haven't heard back from Amherst and Pelham really, so this could potentially not work for them. If anything, they'd want to do it. Um, the word is that Pelham might have an interest mm -hmm. in doing it a little bit earlier. And did you get did the superintendent weigh in? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to share the feedback I should, you know, Sure. with you and with Pelham, which is Pelham is interested in having the evaluation happen sooner primarily because they have an election and um, a spring election and the past couple years we've had the unfortunate mm. situation where folks who have been on the committee all year missed the deadline to participate in the super in evaluation by like a week and that hasn't felt great to folks in Pelham. So for, forgive me, Superintendent, yeah. do you mean faster than this schedule or that this schedule represents a faster schedule they would you want the dates to be earlier. Earlier than this. Okay. Earlier than oh, this. Okay. And um, I think for a whole host of reasons, I think it'd be com hmm. it'd be complicated to do all. F There's no good solution, so I'll put it out there. Like you know, I'm just going to create uh, tension points in the conversation without without coming up with a tangible uh, suggestion. But I think I think that makes sense in Pelham. The goals this year and the standards covered are more different than they ever have been, which is. Uh, both uh, going to be cumbersome in terms of how this all plays out for people on multiple committees. It'd be frankly, you know, just the artifact document. I'm not sure it's possible to have one artifact document this mm -hmm. year. Um, interesting. And so I just think I may have to scale down some of what that looks like just to be very candid with the committee. Uh, if I'm doing three artifact documents, it's probably not going to be as lengthy um, as it was in the past. So uh, actually, I. Oddly enough, it, it's sort of like they don't have to align because I don't think it really matters if they align or not. The downside from a workflow conversation is if I'm doing three distinct documents, actually having a little bit of gap between them would be not the worst thing. If I was doing one document, actually, you'd like them to be aligned. So again, just creating tension points, not necessarily solving, uh, solving issues. I, I, the other thing I'd say is um, this doesn't capture if there are any regional members from member towns who have spring elections who either choose not to run again or are not reelected uh, for this role. And I think that's probably somewhat unavoidable at the regional level when there's multiple election points, you know, between the four towns. It's just, it's hard to pull off. Uh, but I would say that I'd be open to thinking about um, instead of, if, if there was an interest in pushing this back a little bit, um, that having the retreat perhaps in late June or early July instead of in August, that might be an opportunity to do that conversation about goals. Historically, we've done it in August, but there's no rhyme or reason mm -hmm. to that. And so if pushing it back was better for the committees or made, made more sense, uh, I'd be very open to an earlier summer retreat. Uh, we're actually pushing, as an aside, our uh, administrative retreat earlier for the same reason. Sometimes we do the retreats right before the school year. It, it, it's both like really good to get to think about the school year, but so much of the planning work's already done mm -hmm. that it, it doesn't help as much as you think it would. So lots of just information to consider on that. Uh, Mr. Fox? Yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Morris. I don't think there's a solution to this madness. Um, other than possibly thinking about um, allowing people who are off the committee due to not being reelected, be allowed to vote on, officially be allowed to vote on the evaluation to the exclusion of new members. We've actually gotten legal advice from our attorney that we're not allowed to do that. So people who have been on the committee but are gone have no right to participate in the evaluation? Correct. Correct. I mean, it's, it's literally like a statutory matter yeah. that um, the world is binary in terms of school committee status. You either are or you're not a member of the school committee. And if you're a former member, you might as well be on the moon or a former NFL player or anything else you want to be. I mean, it's just, it just doesn't, it, it, they, and it, they're very explicit about that. Very, very explicit about that. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, is there any, I know the hour is late, but this is important. Is there any feedback on, on this? I mean, it, it sounds like you're, getting, you're going to get feedback from the other committees. Yeah. And, 
and you can revise it for next time. Mr. Dunley. You know, the other two tension points that I've seen in the last couple of years, one is that if we do this too early, then the year actually isn't over yet. <laughs> 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 you know, and so we're evaluating you on things that are still in progress and that you're sort of projecting. <coughs> so, I mean, we could start the evaluation now, but then that, you know, you, you'd be missing four or five months. Um, and then if we do it too late and we, and we, and we keep pushing, then that, that delays the starting of next year's process, which is something we've always We've all we've all also complained about, and that it wouldn't it be great if we had directions over the summer. So I I'd say whatever timing, um, I, I guess I would I would lean a lot on on how you feel you can provide reasonable feedback for your for your year that isn't too unreasonably early, um, but also gives us an opportunity, even if it is a a, a retreat focused thing in Julyish, um, to to set the direction for the for the following year. And I, I don't think there's any solution to. Um, Member cycling off and on. <laughs> if we try to avoid that, then um, I think we just pull our hair out. Um, there is a Pelham School Committee meeting Thursday. This this week? Is it, no, we had. Yeah, because it. All right. Then can you please <laughs> clarify all those emails about the school committee meeting because we didn't meet last week when so we I were think supposed you can do that to. Off line because that's a Pelham yeah, school okay. committee meeting. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say, this, yeah, this that it could point. be discussed at the next Pelham School Committee meeting, which I thought was Thursday, but it's not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I, so <laughs> if I had input, you know, and I'll, I'm sure I could share it offline, but if for know. some of these goals, particularly goal number four, which is the one which around strategic planning work at the, and yeah. making school-based plans, I think it, it's not feedback. It's not a recommendation, but I think it depends what the committee wants to see. So that's the one out of all of the um, these four that probably the later you go, the better the quality of the product will be and the better the assessment will be. And um, the earlier will be much more process pieces than it will be more tangible. It's really what the committee would want. It'll be earlier or later won't change. It won't speed up or slow down the process that we have going at the schools around that. It's just going to give functionally different information to the committee. I think it would be great. So generally, I appreciate the work that went into this. I think it's good. <laughs> I think the points that were raised were good. And I think finding a way, the, the golden fleece that we've pursued for a few years is finding a way at the end of the year to start thinking about the next year in a way that informs summer planning. And I think last year we did that in kind of a fake out way by sort of like while we we're discussing the evaluation, people both voted and then opined on what they would like to see worked on, which at least by inference gave you a sense of what to, what we should be focused on. It'd be great to be more deliberate about that. If that means an earlier retreat, I don't really care. But then again, as we know, going into the middle of February, people are already starting to plan, depending on what they do for a living, when, you know, if their kids get out of school or something, when they like drive or jet wherever place they want to get. And so if we don't plan on the retreat, like literally I would calendar the retreat, at least start doing that soon, because otherwise it'll never happen. You'll get close to the 4th of July and everyone will just disappear and then it'll be August. Yeah. Cool, um, so we will move on. Agenda planning. We do have a gift, by the way, just to be clear. We do. Preview of coming attractions, we have noticed. But agenda planning. So what we had for the March 10th meeting, which is the next meeting, uh, Mr. Sullivan has uh, been our facilitator uh, to work to have high school students interested in coming and making a presentation. Yeah. And much like we did with the MSAN students, we'd I think it worked well to have them at the very, very beginning for any other topics because as we found out tonight, high school students are very busy and they have other things they need to do. Uh, so budget hearing and vote, um, food service, um, there's a request for um, a presentation about food service, um, bus contract approval, so we actually, that's just timely because we have to actually vote to approve that contract. Uh, warrant review, school choice vote, um, the Student Opportunity Act was passed by the legislature as part of that. Uh, I have to develop for all three districts uh, a Student Opportunity Act plan 
which details how the funds that we're getting from the Student Opportunity Act will be used. It's an awkward conversation because you all just had a budget hearing where you talked about, but we primarily talked about budget cuts, but it is a requirement of the legislature, so we will do that. So March 10th, it gives an opportunity to see it, perhaps a draft of a plan to be voted on March 24th. It needs to be voted by April 1st in every district in Massachusetts. Mm. It's pretty, for districts like ours that didn't get huge amounts of money, it's, it's pretty small. It's, it's not a huge, huge deal, but um, there was a quest for overdue balance discussion for food and athletic that could be linked to the food service piece. And then I wanted to, yes, to come back with green school ideas at the last meeting after we talked about electric bus, and, uh, and I think in March 10th we'll be able to have a more detailed conversation on that. Mr. Nunley. Um I'd like to see um, at, at the next meeting uh, public comment management. Um, I don't think we need to have a extended, long-ranging policy discussion, but just in terms of specific um, public comment management um, uh, acts uh, and uh, approaches uh, in terms of people sharing time, people going over time. Um, uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about this before, but um, I think I think, we'd, it's, I think it's yes. something we need to do soon. Yeah, you know, we've actually, it's funny because we, we um, when I was talking to Dr. Morris and Ms. McDonald, there was a question about whether, like, the policy committee should develop a policy, but I think you're making a good point, Mr. Demling, that even before that committee might choose to develop and adopt a policy, this committee has never actually had the opportunity to express an opinion on the subject and give any direction to that policy. <laughs> direction, so to speak. It doesn't have to be a vote, but it needs but their opinion, their views to provide input. So I think that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah it's just in terms of the narrow scope of uh, agenda planning, mm -hmm. um, I think it's fine if people want to comment on policy, but my idea for this item would be um, it would be in addition to policy, you know. Like there's there's a lot of chair discretion, for example, that goes on with yeah. how public comment is managed and how lots of policies are implemented. But yeah. um, it doesn't. I don't think it necessarily has to be narrowly focused to, you know, what what, what wording do we want changed on policy? Sure. Yeah. No. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Let's clarify. It. So I just the other thing I'd say is that we have a lot of stuff on March 10th. Not as much on the 24th. One thing that would be useful to do is figure out, not that, that, that item particularly accepted, um, how to like balance the meetings, because probably people are hoping that our next meeting doesn't go till 9.45. we got to figure that out. Because we made a promise to ourselves a long time ago that we, we succeeded for a while, so I don't want to unsucceed. <laughs> yes, stands here. I'm wondering, so we tabled the subcommittee roles discussion. Yeah. Is that something that could be moved to the um, retreat? Or does that have to be done in open meeting? I, I, no, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. You just raised your hand. I did, but you were about to speak, so I did done. I wanted to group. But who knows what I was going to say? Why don't you go ahead and talk? <laughs> so I think I think it, it depends on the scope of the conversation. So retreats, just as a reminder, and I know you know this, but mm -hmm. I'll say it for the public, there are no votes taken, mm -hmm. and there shouldn't be sort of um, debating items that potentially might get to a vote. Um, so I think if that's clean, then that'd be up you to You know that's cool, by the way? That's kind of what I was going to say. You're depends on how the, it better, depends though. on how the item is treated. I've been if, you know, speaking it, clearly it, tonight. You should have jumped in. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, okay. So we have a gift. Oh, I, oh I guess please. It doesn't. I'm not looking for a specific time, but I think we're going to have to have a discussion about icing roads and winter conditions and what happens because four winters ago there was one ice storm. Three winters ago, there was a week in Shootsbury where the roads every morning were iced up. Last winter, there were probably seven or eight, and we're mm -hmm. already getting close to that now. Where like yesterday, yeah. the superintendent put a two hour delay on and we were able to get the snow off the roads. Yeah. But by the time, the, at the same time, the regional buses started running, it started to rain. And so they were, except mm -hmm. for one that went into a ditch, right. which I was able to pull out with my truck, but um, the elementary buses then were all sliding off the road. I mean, it was it just the timing, yeah. and it's just it's 
getting worse. So we're going to have to really talk about what you know what the implications are. You know, how one town affecting an entire school day. It you know. Yeah. I, don't know. I was just going to say I support that, and part of the reason I'm tired and cranky and not clear is, uh, as Mr. Sullivan knows, we've had and we've got more coming. Well, it's like yeah. this morning I went out at 4:30 and checked yes. paved roads and dirt roads, and they were all fine. And at six o'clock, we suddenly had black ice in Shutesbury, and then at 6:30, all every single 16 miles of dirt road turned to ice, and mm. buses were sliding again. Yeah. Oh, I'd be very open to having that conversation. Great. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, for agenda planning, yes. um, just in terms of like the finite set of the meeting and yet it's bursting. Right. Um, so if school committee rules is going to be a discussion, which I don't want to discuss it, <laughs> but I, I kind of feel like maybe it is. Um, green school ideas is something that could, that could go off uh, towards another meeting maybe. I'm not saying it's not a priority. I definitely think it's a priority, but in terms of time urgency, yeah. it might not be um, so, so much on the front burner. I don't mean in general. I mean, <laughs> in well, there, I mean, I, I think there needs to be some balancing in general of the yeah. meetings to make sure the agendas are more manageable. I think you can do that offline. Yeah, and I, I think, appreciate that. Though. Yeah, I agree, and I think it brings up a larger point that's not actually specific to agenda planning, which is just um, agendas are what we we're prioritizing to talk about, and and so you know perhaps. Uh, not so much now, but maybe at the retreat, and I think we did a pretty good job in the past of just kind of resetting that of what are the priorities and, and being focused on those priorities. Right. All right. So, anyone want to read gifts in, in the form of a motion? Spitzer. Um, I move to accept the following gifts from Jones Group Realtors, number 71738, um, to support the 2020 Jones Group Realtors Scholarship in the amount of $500. Is there a second? Second. Uh, moved by Spitzer, second by Stancer. Any uh, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify aye. Carries unanimously. Uh, I'll entertain a further motion. Spitzer? Move to adjourn. Second. Moved by Spitzer, second to McDonald. Not debatable. All those in favor signify aye. Carries unanimously. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>